We had some fiery chess on day one of the Chessable Masters. The 2024 Champions Chess Tour kicks off. Will day two give us just as much drama? I think so. Don't go anywhere. Games start in just a few. He's down a piece. He's down two pawns. A couple of checks. Magnus' king is going to dance easily out of them. Oh. Take my queen and give me a new one, please. Ooh. He's losing now. Yep. He walked right into that. Beam. And they know it. They know it. Turn your board. 909. 9.52. Probably made a big mistake. Oh, and the bar's going up. This is an absolute gem of a game. And Wesley Saw has done it. He's going in for the attack, but he's walked into checkmate. Black and play rook takes pawn. It's day two of the Chessable Masters. The 2024 Champions Chess Tour is officially underway. He's Grandmaster Danya Naradinsky, International Master Danny Wrench. Danya, yesterday was a blasty Mick Blasterson. I think that's the scientific term for what went down. Your biggest takeaway as we head into day two. Blasty McBlasterson, I think you need to lay off on the on the high technical jargon, Danny, just to you know <laughs> include all of the viewers. But that's exactly what it was. Nonstop action, incredible results. We had such uh, an amazing menu of games to choose from. And guess what? We have an amazing menu of games to choose from today. And there's even more on the line. That's right. For everyone who still getting a little bit acquainted with the format, yesterday was the play-in, which is a Swiss tournament. Everybody jumps in to the arena, and it gets wild. Of course, some of the biggest names and some upsets got their way into day two, where now we have match play. A lot to talk about over the next 10 minutes before games get underway, including the fact that the matchups you're going to see, they were chosen by the opponents, meaning there's some drama already. You got chosen by someone. How does that make you feel? We're going to get into all of that in just a minute. But before we do, because some of you might have actually missed yesterday and made a big mistake, we're going to let this uh, this quick highlight reel let you know what went down. The 2024 Champions Chess Tour kicks off with the Chessable Masters. What upsets and what interesting players turn our heads today? Yeah, White is going to be lucky if he doesn't get mated. The Queen and the Dark Squares are a problem for that White King. Bishop to oh, D4. Oh, he blundered his Queen! Oh, he blundered Rook H3! Fabi can't believe it! And you don't want to prolong the game! He blundered oh, the game! He blundered the no! God, what are you doing? And now he's worse. He's undeveloping his pieces. It just doesn't okay, work. By the way, we disaster. can't even catch ahead. Jose Martinez, he's on five out of five. Rook D2, Rook D1, Knight C1 check, and King B2. No, it's over. That's it. Hikaru calculates it to the end. Played oh King to God, D4. King D4. <gasps> he must have misclicked. Oh my God. David Anton is apparently finding all the best moves. What an absolutely oh. crazy turnaround. David wow. Anton wins. And those are the standings, as you can see, four of them didn't even have to play today to do it. One of them played fantastic chess. That was Jose Martinez. Of course, at the end of the day, it was Jospam, Jose Martinez, the birthday boy, Danya. He was on top of them all. At the end, Hikaru Nakamura had his chances and then blundered in such an uncharacteristic way. Gave gave the birthday boy a gift. But uh, Danya, lots of fun. We saw we saw some of the dramatic moments there. Let's talk a little bit about the players who are now fighting even further for their placement to get into Division One. Let's uh, let's bring up the players, of course. As we said, we've got Jospam on top. He was the he was the only person who immediately has already guaranteed his spot, uh, along with the other players in gold who got their buy via the format, kind of a rollover from the previous year, Yana Pomashi, Anish Giri, Vladislav Artemyev, and Sam Sevian. But then we get into the other players. All of those names had to compete in the placement. Your thoughts about maybe who who was on the best form, Danya, other than the guy who obviously won the thing? Well, obviously, some of these names we look at and we expect them to be in the top 15. Wesley, Ikaru, Ali Reza, Perugia. But first of all, I want to highlight Peter Svidler. P. Svidi was in phenomenal form from the very first game until the very last game. He dispatched so many strong players, so many younger players, carrying forward the older generation along with Ralph Mamedov and also Sam Sahakin, Armenian GM. 
He's about 2,600, but he's an incredibly dangerous player, Danny. And we've talked about it. That 2,600 swamp, those players are hungry to score upsets and to show that, yes, we can compete with the likes of Ali Reza Ferruja and Hikaru Nakamura. I love that. And it's funny because you you mentioned a couple of names in particular, Peter Svidler, Peace Fitty, his rap name, don't call it a comeback. But then he got chosen by Somville Tershakin. So let's let's actually bring up the matchup card and talk a little bit about this because we really didn't give it its justice at the end of the day yesterday. It was a long day and a lot of people were ready, ready to go get some dinner and some snacks, Donnie and I included. But real quick reminder, with one of the slight adjustments to the format, every player you see playing the white pieces, David Anton, Hikaru Nakamura, Ali Reza Perugia, Sam Belters, Ter, uh, S- S- Sakin, and then of course Vincent Keimer, they chose their opponents, Danya. Of course, that make that makes a lot of people wonder why in the world did Vincent Keimer choose Wesley so? In fact, he's the only person who didn't get to choose his opponent. He was kind of stuck with Wesley after everyone else chose theirs. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of middle school PE uh, when <laughs> you know people would choose teams, and I'm kind of the last man standing. But obviously, it's a choice between some pretty unappealing options. And if you're Sam Valterra and you're not choosing Peter Svidler because he's bad. Or you think he's a bad player and it's going to be easy. You're choosing him because the other names are even less appealing. Not that Peter right. Svidler himself is weak. But I'm also really yeah. interested in Dennis Lazovic versus Hikaru Nakamura. Dennis Lazovic made a major name for himself in Toronto. Uh, he might not have done as well as he hoped. But that's not going to be an easy game for Hikaru Nakamura at all. And it's interesting Ameta because if we go in order, let, mm-hmm. let's actually remind everybody as we're looking at this how it went down in real time. Because again, it was a long day yesterday. The first time we had gone through this format, the players were picking their opponents for the first time. Here's what actually happened in real time. This is fascinating. David Anton went first. Remember, he actually uh-huh. tied Jospom in terms of total points. He chose Ralph Mometov, Danya which meant Hikaru Nakamura going second of all the players remaining chose Dennis Lazovic, which left Sambil Tursahakian with a choice between Yu Yong Yi, Vincent Keimer, Wesley So, or Ali Reza Perugia. Well, then it makes a lot more sense to choose Peter Spither. Nothing against Peter, but if you're looking at it, that's what Sambil Tursahakian was faced with. Then Ali Reza Perugia chose Yu Yong Yi, which ultimately stuck Vincent Keimer with Wesley So. So, okay, I, I think we've... We've kind of broken that down, John. It's fascinating, right? When you consider how that how that happened with Anton and then Hikaru, all the matchups kind of make sense. And if you're Vincent Keimer, you're like, man, I'm stuck with Wesley So right now. Yeah, and I mean, even for David Anton, you have a wider choice. So you might be able to choose a slightly more convenient opponent. But Ralph Mamedov is a former 2700 feet, a one of the strongest blitz and bullet players on the site. I mean, again, it's very important to emphasize David Anton isn't choosing Rafa Medov because he thinks it's going to be an easy match. You just listed the other choices. And I mean, can you choose nobody? Can you choose Danny Wrench? Like, <laughs> what, what are you? That what was, am I wow, implying? We're not early in this show. And that really. That, no, that it's really just because is. you're so good that nobody wanted to choose you because it's actually exactly, a compliment. No. I hear you, and I think, you know, as a, as a commentator and as a very kind person, I know you, you're you kind of already thinking about Ralph Mamedov's feelings at the other side of that, but I'm going to be <laughs> honest. True. At the same time, Danya, he did choose Ralph Mamedov, and Lazovic did, did get chosen by Hikaru. So those players, while they may understand objectively, it still might sting a little bit, and I love that angle as we head in to today's match play. And speaking of that, let's remind everybody, the Swiss is behind us. What is ahead in the format today? It is two game mini matches. Of course, the time control, it remains 10 minutes plus okay. two seconds per move one and a half points wins a match obviously that would be a best of two if we're still tied of course we will head to armageddon reminder that the advantage of having a great day in the swiss is that even if you lose these matchups you're still guaranteed division two ultimately in terms of the overall season that is absolutely critical because you have to give yourself the best possible chances as we go forward to remain in the hunt for that grand finals golden ticket uh, so, fascinating stuff ahead. These two game matches with Armageddon tie breaks, if necessary, is what we have in store. And uh, before we go any further, the games are getting close. So, let's remind everybody overall of what the format is. We want to continue to educate everybody that while it is complicated, it's also incredibly exciting. Fixing big problems in chess where we want everyone to have a chance, yet still make sure the biggest names will make sure that they're not out of the hunt in the end. So, here is our format explainer video. Pay close attention because when Danya and I get back, it's time for chess to be played on the board.
The year-long Champions Chess Tour consists of four main online events and one live final. Each event will begin with a play-in tournament open to all grandmasters and top finishers from qualifying events. 69 players from the play-in will be joined on the second day by the four qualifiers from the previous tour event. Match play with 73 players will then determine placement across all three divisions. Division play then commences with six days of double elimination brackets. The last players standing are your winners. The winner of Division 1 qualifies directly to the CCT Finals. The winner of Division 2 secures a spot in Division 1 at the next tour event, while the winner of Division 3 is guaranteed at least a spot in Division 2. In each event, players also accrue points for the season-long leaderboard. The final standings will decide who joins our Division 1 winners at the year-end CCT Live Finals. Each regular season event will feature a whopping $300,000 prize pool, while the final eight players will battle it out for their part in half a million dollars in prizes at the final. That's $1.7 million for grabs in the 2024 Champions Chess Tour. So tune in and watch all the action as the best chess players in the world compete to be crowned the next CCT champion. Peter Spidler, Peace Fitty, as we called him, a bookshelf we've gotten to know well ever since his debut competition <laughs> in the Fisher Random World Chess Championship back in 2019. And look at that. Did you know he's a Hearthstone enthusiast? I did actually know he plays Hearthstone. Um, I don't remember when I had this conversation. I think it was 2015 in Gibraltar on a bus where Peter Siddler was talking <laughs> about Hearthstone, talking about all the other games uh, that he plays. And he also mentioned back then that Jan Nepomnishi was a big fan of Dota. So what, you think these chess players, that's all they do? No, 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 no. They are very much multi-talented. And I love that. When was Peter Siddler ever presented as a top player in a chess tournament as a Hearthstone enthusiast. That might be the first time ever. And to me, it's a little more interesting than being reminded of the fact that he's also a many time Russian champion. And of course, uh, 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 someone who's competed in the candidates and of course has an amazing chess career, but also a Hearthstone enthusiast. And I'll add to that. He's more than a Hearthstone enthusiast for those who don't know. He's very, very good at Hearthstone. I don't know the rankings yeah. specifically not qualified to speak on that, but, uh, but he, uh, he would likely take you to town in Hearthstone. So, all right. I think we're I think we're getting set. I think the chess is ready to be played. The players are uh the players are here. We're going to be diving in to uh to to moves on the game. We're going to start with Wesley So in and Vincent Keimer and you know, again, I think it's of all the matchups which we are spoiled for choice here, Danya. I think it's one of the most fascinating because it's the only matchup where the higher seed got stuck with their opponent. Everybody else had already been taken off right. the board. Wesley So was that last kid standing in the middle school playground, except in this case, you really didn't want to pick him. Yeah, that's exactly right. And they actually haven't played that many head-to-head -head games. I'm seeing two over-the-board games, one in 2023 uh, in Tata Steel. Wesley So won. Uh, Vincent Keimer uh, defeated Wesley at the WR uh, Chess Masters in Dusseldorf. So... I really, yeah. really like seeing these relatively newer matchups. Even though Vincent is now 2740 Fide, he just hasn't been at the top long enough to be able to play a lot of games against Wesley So. So it's going to be a new match. Big opening experts, both of them, are incredibly booked up. Of course, Vincent has been training now with none other than Peter Lecco for many, many years, and that shines through every single move that he makes. Speaking of moves that are made, We've got some moves on the board, Danny, and we're off. Moves moves on the board in English that quickly transposes into a Queen's Gambit declined. We'll see. Okay, so a uh, not necessarily a tame line, but a line that avoids some of the weirdly complex Rogozins, if you will, and some other stuff. So Keimer going directly into the, the very concrete C takes D5 and E3 to follow. So your thoughts quickly on maybe what he wants to avoid against Wesley or a, or a specific line he has in mind? Well, this is called the Carlsbad Pawn Structure. It's named after the city in Germany, I think, where uh, in the early 1900s, uh, this line started to become popular. And Bishop F5 is is its own island because White can play yeah. Queen F3 here. And this is a line that has also been popular now for many, many decades. Gary Kasparov, Vladimir Kramnik used to play it in the 1990s. Queen F3, 
The bishop drops back to g6. White trades everything on f6, and you get this incredibly unconventional endgame, which looks really, really ugly for Black, but because Black has the bishop pair, and because Black's pawn structure on the queen side and in the center is so incredibly solid, I think the current evaluation is something like a minuscule edge for White, and this is exactly what we have. This is a very, very well-studied endgame, Danny. Yeah, and Keimer goes right forward with the move king to d2, designed to then probably play bishop d3 at some point, natural development. But you already highlighted the framing of this position is going to be all about does white's long-term positional edge on the king side pay dividends, or does black get enough kind of dynamic play for the bishop pair? As you pointed out, this, this queen side pawn structure, normally something that white wants to take advantage of in a middle game with a minority attack, something where you advance the B pawn, try to undermine. But with the queens off the board so early and the king in the center, white isn't looking to flex in the same way anymore. And so that's another thing that black has going for him is that the position is very, very solid without having to worry about this minority attack. So I kind of like the choice for Wesley. Probably he'd be happy with a draw if we're thinking about match play and then getting a chance with the white pieces next. What do you think about that? The vast majority of players, I think, are happy to adhere to that strategy, particularly Wesley, who's kind of a classically trained player. Uh, he's not used to taking too many risks of the black pieces, and especially against someone like Vincent, who's so solid um, and also kind of a, a player with a very classical Peter Lecco-esque style. Um, so Wesley yeah. more than happy with, you know, kind of a, a low-maintenance kind of draw. But I'm not suggesting that this line always ends in a draw. This is actually a very rich strategical endgame. And if white overpresses, black, of course, also uh, can win games in this variation. This is a rapid game. Anything can happen. But I like the way that Vincent is handling the opening. He gets his knight to g3. Danny, he's fighting for that f5 square. He's going to bring his bishop out to d3. And ultimately, he will try to entrench a knight on f5. So very, very rich, very interesting endgame. And we'll see how it develops. I love it. It is a rich and interesting end game, but guess what? We have a rich and interesting middle game to go check out. I don't know if I'm going to jump right to it or if we want to go to the bird's eye view to take a peek and I'll let you know which, I'll let you choose which game I'm talking about oh if my you gosh. want, but uh, uh -huh. it's, I'm just going to do it. It's Ikaro Nakamura versus Dennis Lazovic. I'm switching over and what in the world is going on here? Lazovic already with an edge is black. This is like a a reverse Sveshnikov gone wild uh -huh. X-rated edition. I was going to say, let me tell you what's going on here. Hikaru Nakamura is much worse, and I'm still trying to count the pawns. This is the kind of position that you would want to get, uh, and you're at least up a pawn. You've got something to suffer for, but here, White isn't even up a pawn. How did this happen in 12 moves, and how did this get so bad? And moreover... Lazovic is threatening yeah. a crushing check on F3, Danny. He's also threatening the move knight to B3. So Hikaru's oh, only oh move here God. might be might be bishop to E2. I mean, why is borderline lost here? Okay, we have to go to the back cave and do some analysis. He's I'm it. gonna jump right into it. Oh He's my missed gosh. Knight B3. Knight B3 wins the game. Knight B3 is is lights out. And Knight B3 hits the rook and threatens F2. It doesn't matter whether you take it or not. What exactly. in the world is happening here? And Hikaru is shaking is his head. essentially like, lights out. Hikaru's yeah. coffee hasn't kicked in yet, or he needs to turn off the pineapple behind him to get rid of the glare because he's clearly not seeing the board in the way that Hikaru Nakamura normally does. Again, I'm going to analyze. We have to back up and just see how we got here, Don. It was in English to start for Hikaru. E5, okay. A3. Okay. This is already kind of designed to sort of flip colors. You have this reversed Sicilian kind of idea for white with the with the C4 E5 dynamic. But shout out when you see something weird. Okay, already D3. D3 okay. instead of D4. That's normally the way you undermine the knight here, right? Yeah, D4 is the main move, and it leads to this very double-edged endgame. E takes D4, bishop takes out four, D takes C3. I've seen this line before. Um, yeah. And White trades on d8, and maybe Hikaru didn't want to get an endgame this quickly, but then, you know, why are you going into this line? Knight b3, by the way, has been found. Dennis Lazovic oh wins gosh. Hikaru's rook in the corner. But your point is well taken, Danny. After bishop g4, Dennis just plays this in a very Soviet schoolboy way. Just trade on f3, get the d4 square, and this is just an awful position just, for Nakamura. This is like... 
all the things you try to avoid when you're when you're on the black side of the Sicilian in these Sveshnikov structures, because again, the Sveshnikov for for black, I'll say, only really works by you know the fact that you're giving up such huge positional weaknesses. It only works because of the other dynamic compensating factors that black gets. And so if you're just giving, in this case, giving black all of these tempi, it's a nightmare to deal with. And black is just already completely dominating on the dark squares. Normally, again, that's the light squares if we were to reverse colors in a Sveshnikov. And Hikaru just goes into the fray, completely blundering knight to b3. And look at that. It's a brilliant symbol for those of us who do our game review. And Hikaru has sacrificed the rook on a1. This is wow. absolutely insane, Danya. So, sacrifice is a pretty flattering way of putting it. It's, it's how I used to <laughs> yeah. explain, you know, to my coach when I would blunder a piece <laughs> in one move. And I would start, even during the game, I would already start rehearsing the stories. I sacrificed it, and okay, the sacrifice didn't work out. No, Hikaru is simply down a rook here. He has to find a way to generate some counterplay. And the game is not over. He can put a knight on d5, Danny. He can push b2, b4. And he's going to try to muddy the waters. He's going to try to make Dennis Lazovic nervous. But right now, I don't even see a way for White to win that knight. He goes queen h5. Okay, but black can just castle kingside. And the queen on h5 is a complete paper tiger. And the knight on a1 is essentially going to evacuate through b3. I mean, barring a miracle, this game is over. <clears throat> yeah, this is one of this those things terrible. that just blows your mind. And it does show that even at the highest levels, occasionally opening prep can go wrong and and even just opening understanding, right? Not necessarily appreciating the dangers if you don't go for the main line, which again, to remind everybody, we don't need analysis, but to just quickly show that the only real move here for White is D4 into this forcing reverse Feshnikov kind of endgame. Hikaru played D3 and the wheels have just been coming off ever since. I... Uh, I, I'm, my mind is blown. Yeah, this is, you don't see this every day. You don't see this at all uh, in Hikaru Nakamura's practice. That's why we're so shocked. And of course the game is not over. And I would caution people against, uh, against counting Hikaru out. I mean, how many of these impossible comebacks have we seen? This is the Hikaru effect in a nutshell. No matter who's sitting in front of him, whether it's someone as experienced as Dennis Lazabek or Magnus Carlsen, people get really nervous when they sense that they're very close to defeating Hikaru in a big game. But what a big game this would be. Barring a crazy miracle, Danny, a victory with black over Hikaru in game one, that would really put Hikaru's back against the wall, especially because Dennis is so solid to the white pieces. He's a D4 player. He's really, yeah. really hard to beat on demand. So... I'm I'm shocked. I'm shocked at this turn of events. We're only 17 moves in, and Hikaru's missing a rook on a1. Yeah, there's it's literally you kind of you okay. kind of tune in and you tune in and you go, wait, what? How did we get this position here? Uh, Hikaru shaking his head even further. He understands that bishop f5 just doesn't work after g6. Like, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if Hikaru resigned here. You can literally see the the game the game status graph below there showing that with d3, things first started going wrong, but then bishop h3, and, uh, and things just fell apart. Okay, Hikaru's not going to resign. He plays queen to g4, but this is a plus 5 advantage for black, and then we're not even on move 20. Not I something mean, you see every day. Black is literally up a rook for no compensation, and the only threat that white has here is bishop takes e6, and then queen takes e6 check, and even if that happens, it's not the end of the world for black, but the most clinical move here is knight e6 back to g7, drop the knight back, retreat it to safety, and if white plays the move bishop to g5, Danny, you could respond with f6, and actually, in that particular instance, both of White's bishops are hanging. So we're yeah. literally two or three accurate moves away from resignation here. But this is sometimes where Hikaru's opponents tend to slip up when they're winning and they sense that they're they're oh so close. Here, it's really important for Dennis to keep his composure and not kind of let Hikaru back in the game, not let Hikaru keep extending this game and putting pressure on his clock. 100%. Uh, I... 
I'm guessing that Lazovic is up to the task. Speaking as someone who at one point was not up to the task, a funny, funny clip that exists somewhere on the internet. I won a rook against Hikaru in some tournament long ago, uh, a streamer's event. It was either a Title Tuesday or Arena Kings, and I lost that game. So I have lost up a rook to Hikaru. <laughs> but um, <laughs> who hasn't? <laughs> I don't think. I don't think Laz, and I know I'm not alone in that. A lot of people have, but uh, I don't think Lazovic will be someone who who stumbles to that degree. Uh, you point out knight g7, which is a very clear move to find because it also just unpins the pawn. So it's both a logical move that that puts the knight who's currently attacked to safety and immediately renews the threat of taking the bishop. Um, at this point. Okay. I will be surprised if this game is still going after move 25. I think Hikaru will probably see great defense, throw in the towel, and try to clear his head for the all-out attempt to win his black and force Armageddon. It's his only choice at yeah. this point. And he I don't know. I mean, Dennis has been thinking now for quite a while. I'm looking over at his clock. King h8. I don't love that move. I don't understand why knight g7 wasn't played. That was a really easy move. Okay, now bishop well, takes c6, f takes c6, and bishop g5, and maybe you could try to stir the pot a little bit. I, I Okay, I hear you, but again, I think you're suffering from a little bit of Hikaru bias-itis. There's an affliction yeah. for it. You can see a doctor about it if you really <laughs> want, to, want to get that taken care of. I actually love king h8 from a practical perspective. I just forced a trade off the board. You attack my queen. I'm going to play queen to d7, and you're... Okay, if I play queen d7, you can have take six. a1, but then I, then I get f2. That's oh. true, queen d7. But queen d7, I will play knight to f6. And queen it's G7 just a lit. And... The queen takes c6. I guess then you can move your knight out of a1. Okay, it's gonna it's on the board. Yes, you're queen right. Queen d7, knight is completely winning. Black, black saves the knight, and in the end, you're down a rook. <laughs> like that, that's yes. a rook. I can't argue have with ever, that. Have you it ever is, seen a, a Levy Rosman video? That's a rook. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to spare you the screaming. And bishop f6 check, simply king g8 was a dead end. So Hikaru tries knight f6, still fighting. And not only am I afflicted with Hikaru I bias itis, but it's just I'm tra I'm traumatized. It's, I have been on the receiving end of so many of these completely winning positions. You think that there is no way. This is not the kind of game where Hikaru is going to pull out a comeback. And then suddenly you start getting low on time. Your fingers turn to thumbs. Your hands start shaking, and you find essentially the only way, the only way, Borknik and I always joke about this, we find the only way to make things complicated against Hikaru. Okay, he succeeded in making this a little bit dicey. I would play knight c2. Okay, maybe knight d7 can be tried. Still going, still trying, what? still fighting. I would play knight d4, give up the pawn. I mean, I don't know, maybe even just save my bishop. I just want to or get bishop all my D6. pieces in the game and, and remind him that I'm that I'm up a rook if I'm Dennis Lazovic. Probably the biggest mistake you can make, as you said, is to continue to try to be perfect and get yourself down to under a minute. I think as long as he plays quickly and has time on the clock, yeah. Hikaru's opening mistakes will come back to haunt him. But look at this. Bishop. Hikaru just continues to play fast. It this doesn't is, matter. He's just going to keep going. But knight d4, okay, h5, and black should win. If if this goes down as a Hikaru comeback, I I will have literally seen it all at this point. I'm getting I'm getting old. It's been 16 years here for the old man in chess.com. I just <laughs> I don't know that I need to stick around after this. If Hikaru comes back and wins this game. Oh. <laughs> like, no, this was too much. I mean, this was just a full rook. The problem was that this was literally a full rook with no compensation, and this knight b3 shot. That is just not the kind of tactical sequence that Hikaru misses every day. Okay, Lazovic is too experienced of a blitz player, I think, to let this one slip. Bishop h6 yeah. might be tried, but okay, queen f7, black is completely winning. No, Lazovic has this completely under control at this point. I think Hikaru is smart not to play bishop h6 because his, his, he understands that no material makes a difference here. The only thing that will help is keeping this thing as confusing as possible. But here comes, I mean, even knight f3, if we want to just like force more pieces off the board, another trade. Yes. I mean, not to say that we can't 
recommend a lot of moves. Okay, like Queen F Queen E6 makes sense because I think he wants to double rooks. This will be straightforward. Probably okay. we should switch. What? Go ahead. No, I'm I'm just sort of again. I, I guess I'm just traumatized. But yes, I agree. Probably Lazovic has this in his pocket. He'll play C5. He'll finish this one off. It's hard to switch away from Hikaru because, you, you know, it's like a deer in the headlights, right? I mean, I feel a little bit frozen to what we're witnessing, but the reality is Dennis Lazovic is up a rook. Hikaru <laughs> is going to need going to need to dig deep to keep his uh, Division One in our first Champions Chess Tour event hopes alive. Uh, and, hey, he has to win with black on command to force Armageddon. But we have another another matchup that's also getting wild. Ali Reza Faruja with the white pieces. He chose his opponent in Yu Yong Yi, and I think he has a little bit more going on. So I'm going to switch over to that one. And, uh, oh, wait. Ali Reza looks like he's about to put this one away, don't you? Ali Reza's totally winning here. He's up two pawns, and this is just a matter of technique. I'm looking at some of the other games, which are also heating up. Teresa Hakin, I think, is yeah. outplaying Peter Svidler um, in a crazy position. This is a real Lopez where White demonstrated such skill and such knowledge of all the typical ideas, just looking at that game um, in the mini view was already impressive. I think Peter is in serious trouble here with his back against the wall, literally. He's got no space to maneuver. Look at that queen that's infiltrated, yep. A7. Oh, this is looking dicey for Black. Yu Yong Yi is, uh... okay, you know, there are a lot of experts these days that exist on the white side of these of these very deep and come very deeply prepared spanish positions but he's one of them he's one of the world's experts and uh i don't know exactly where this one went wrong we can we can analyze Whoa. it if it's if it's to your fancy but go ahead what i'm just looking at david antone versus mamedov another game that's heating up uh, but we don't have to jump around if you want to if we you want to stay can, here hey I'm into what you're into here. I'm just like a candy Aww. candy score. I, I, I've got it all. Me you can too. go to chess.com slash events. Choose your own adventure. What? No, me too. I'm. I, this is a really, really interesting round, actually. And I think Sam Bell I, essentially has this under control. Okay. Well, let's, let's head over to the bird's eye view, actually, just so we can take a quick peek. And I will give our not necessarily obligatory shout out, but the, the reminder that you can go to chess.com slash events and watch all of these games yourself. Remember that every move you see and the broadcast itself is on a delay for fair play reasons. Of course, our players are on very, very close watch, two cameras and all other kinds of proctoring going on. You don't get to see the other views that we get to see and the checks they go through. But uh, but yeah, what you're watching is on delay, but you see it in real time as far as you're concerned. And I'm uh, I'm looking at all of these games, Danya. Uh, every oh. game is complex. I <laughs> I would bet we get five decisive results. I'm doing it. I'm jinxing it. Knocking on wood. Commentator's curse. We're going to have five decisive results here in the first round. Oh, it's entirely possible. I mean, Vincent Keimer is struggling against Wesley So. Lazovic is going to win. Uh, Faruja is very likely to win. Now, the Anton versus Mamedov game is it just a crap show. It's a crazy position where both sides have now under a minute. I mean, look at this. And this yeah. is a typical Ralph Mamedov game. Rook yep. takes e3 was the last move, sacrificing <laughs> the exchange. Oh, queen takes e3. He has knight takes d1, counter hitting the queen. This is this is crazy. We're gonna have to analyze this a little bit just to show how many pieces are are under fire here. He what? takes c6 first, which which makes sense. But the last couple moves here started with white allowing knight takes f2 rather than trading on d3. Wait. What? Yeah, no, this is insane. What? Knight d3 was a crazy move what? by Mamedov. But, but hey, there was nothing why on white d3. Just... <laughs> I guess white didn't take it because of rook takes e3, followed by queen into f2 and checkmate. Although, funnily enough, white could have done this and played rook f1. This is what the okay. engine says. That's a, that's a hard move to find. Yeah, that is incredibly cold-blooded. So he dropped back to D2, and he sacrificed the exchange, and Mamedov says, no, I don't want your exchange. I yeah. want your F2 pawn. And then things got even crazier. Rook, Rook F1. F1. 
Rook takes e3. Again, just remind everybody, taking was Rook. never an option because queen takes and queen g2 is mate. So rook f1 met by another exchange sack. White gets rid of that monster of a bishop on, on uh, c6, spying g2. And now, I guess in the end, we're just headed toward a very peaceful and tame opposite code bishop ending. So that's what happens in chess. Hey, we know that chess is a draw. Okay, white is in the <laughs> driver's seat by a small margin, but white's dark squares are also kind of weak. So I wouldn't be so sure that this is just a two-result game. I think it's essentially a one-result game. We're heading in the direction of a draw, provided that Ralph Mamedov does not drop his C6 pawn. And even if he does, even if he does and the queens are traded, yeah. Bishop D4 takes C5, will pick up uh, the C5 pawn, and that should be a pretty easy hold uh, for Mamedov. This might be our only draw because Hikaru Nakamura has lost say. to Lazovic. Just... Just in time for Danny to say we'd have five decisive results. I get my first commentator <laughs> jinx of the day in, and we're not even a half an hour into the show. You're welcome, whoever had that prop bet going. Um, all right. I think, okay, we can go away from this one. Anton yeah. and Mamedov will play this one out. I'm going to, I, I got to go back to, Hik okay, never mind. We got to go see the final position. Lazovic did get the job done with Black. If you're just tuning in, what a wild. What a wild game this was. Hikaru Nakamura blundering early out of the opening. Ali Reza Faruja ultimately did convert this position versus Yu Yang Yi. Wesley So won with black against Vincent Keimer. So that means we are down to just two games left. And that was the one we were just on that's going to be a draw. Okay. And then we have Peter Svidler versus Sambel Tursahakian. And this one is... I was going to say a two-result game. This was winning for Sam Bell. I still feel like he's got winning chances. He's going to be up a pawn in this opposite card bishop end game with rooks on the board. Both sides down to 10 seconds. Peter Svidler trying to hold it. He basically has to keep his bishop on yeah. the f8 a3 diagonal in order to prevent rook g8 check. And f8 queen, rook c8, rook c8. Rook g8 and rook c8. Rook g8 and rook c8. Oh, okay. God. I was wondering what it's over. Black's pieces are overworked. Oh my gosh. Nothing Peter can do. He's overextended yeah. and he's resigned. What's funny is the move that everybody would play, Donya, was the losing move. Rook F2 check put the rook on a square that ultimately overwhelmed the bishop, right? This is why you can't always just give a check. Ultimately, now the bishop was overwhelmed trying to guard both the tower and the square. And that's what uh, that's what led to the position falling apart. Some forcing tactics, and uh, I feel like that was over before it even started. What in the world I is know. going on here? What that round? I mean, I totally know what you mean. It felt like it started, and already Hikaru was losing like one minute into the round, and then boom, Vincent Keimer losing in that relatively risk-free line with the white pieces to Wesley. So, what a round! Yeah, just to remind you everybody what happened. So defeats Keimer. Faruja defeats Yu Yang Yi. Lazovic takes down Hikaru Nakamura with black. Hikaru really in a tough spot now. Must win territory to force Armageddon with black. Not, not how you draw it up at home. David Anton and Mamedov did draw the only game that proved peaceful. And Peter Svidler went down to Sambail Tursahakian. So, OMGs or snaps. Is that, a, is that a thing I'm still allowed to say? OMGs or snaps? It, you most certainly are allowed to say it. I mean, I think that correctly captures the atmosphere of the situation for Hikaru Nakamura. That it might be the biggest storyline of these mini matches so far. A must win with the black pieces, which is actually some of the most entertaining chess, Danny, that we get as chess fans. When a player needs to win with the black pieces, all of yep. the bridges are burned from the very beginning of the game. Yeah. Crazy stuff. And we're going to get right into round two. But before we do, Let's get this uh, real quick instant replay action of what happened in the moments that Wesley So took down Vincent Keimer. The trophies. Look at the trophies. <laughs> Look at the big the big sigh of relief there from Wesley So. Slow motion fist pump. And who says chess isn't a contact emotional sport? Wesley So giving us giving us the Tiger Woods there, Danya. Oh, that was man, the emotion on Wesley So. Oh my gosh, jumping up and down, yelling. The entire state of Minnesota <laughs> heard his yells after that win. But um, in all seriousness, big win for Wesley. 
he takes these tournaments very seriously. He's had an incredible track record in online events, Danny, and showing that once again here, all he needs is a draw with the white pieces in order to win his first mini match. The other person who only needs a draw is Dennis Lazovic, also with yeah. white. Obviously, there were other decisive games, but if you're just tuning in, where have you been? We have drama. Massive, massive upset with Dennis, Dennis Lazovic taking down Hikaru Nakamura with the black pieces to kick things off here. On day two of our placement stage, we started with a Swiss for the players to get here. Now the players are fighting for their Division One placement standing and lives, if you will. Uh what do you do if you're Hikaru Nakamura, right? You started off on the wrong foot. Now you're black. You're looking to do one of your sort of double fee and keto hippo specials, Danya, right? We've seen him do that before to create tension and confusion. But the risk, of course, is you're always taking on a dubious position when you choose those types of openings. And the problem, Dennis Lazovic is not a good guy to face if you need to win on demand. You would much rather face someone like Parha Maksudla, like we saw Gukesh. He needed yeah. to win with Black to keep pace with the leaders. Okay, it's not that Parham is bad. It's just that he will give you chances because someone like Maxudlu or even Ali Reza Faruja, they don't really know how to play for a draw. They're going to play for a win. But Dennis Lazovic, he's a D4 player. He loves Fianchetto's setups, and he's just so solid with the white pieces. If you're Hikaru Nakamura, you do need a King's Indian, maybe a Dutch. Um, or like you said, Danny, maybe he'll just pre-move G6 and get something unbalanced, but that's just right. the start of the process. It's not enough to get an unbalanced position. Dennis Lazovic can do tactics too. And there we see Hikaru streaming. If you want to go check out his commentary, I think he's on kick this morning. We can actually see the fair play camera, his phone yep. uh, dialed in, dialed in to, uh, to, to, to make sure that the team has his full field of vision under their observation. But yeah, it, it, you're right. Lazovic is not the style of player you want to go up against, right? He's like a, what do you want? Like a mini Komsky or something, right? Just so mm -hmm. solid and and very difficult nut to crack. Not someone who's going to give you dynamic chess. Maybe that backfires a little bit, right? Because I think from, you talked about the nerves perspective, he's still a young player. We oh, know yeah. what a giant Hikaru Nakamura is. If you're over solid and you give Black too many chances, that can also be something that haunts you. And you know how much it means, to, particularly to a younger player, to defeat Hikaru Nakamura in any format, even a seemingly meaningless three-minute game, but particularly a game on a bigger stage, uh, such as the inaugural CCT event, uh, to kick it off with a victory over Hikaru in a mini-match, huge confidence boost. That's just big. And so you're feeling nervous. You're feeling like you're right there. You're knocking on the door. Dennis Lazovic just essentially needs to pretend that this is a one-off game. Right, You don't want to go through the mental calculus of, oh, I need to draw, so what do I play? Just play chess. Just play your game. That is the best bet, I think, for Dennis Lazovic. And something tells me Hikaru is he's definitely not going to go gentle into that good night. He will pull out all the stops to make this an interesting and unbalanced game. We are in for an amazing round where Peter Svidler and Vincent Keimer are essentially in the same boat. But at least Svidler has the white pieces. Yeah, that's the difference, and that's the tough thing if you're both Vincent Keimer and Hikaru Nakamura, respectively. It's not, that, not just that you lost, Danya, you lost with White. So, okay, we're going to get into those particular matchups, but the first one where we already have moves on the board, Ralph Mometa mm -hmm. taking on David Anton. This is, this is the only matchup in this second round of games, if you're just tuning in, where the players are not facing must-win territory. They drew their first game. Here we've got a very close-looking French, something that, uh, if you don't mind, I might take a nap. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind at all, Danny. <laughs> you won't face any judgment from me. <laughs> no, just just kidding there. This one has the potential to get spicy as well. It's kind of a unique-looking French. I'm just going to quickly run through the opening moves so we see that it actually started with the Carol Khan. The E5 extended, allowed the bishop outside the pawn chain, which is one of the key differences between this structure and a traditional French, is even though it's closed, Black's bishop, not blocked in behind the pawn chain as it normally would be the the infamous French bad bishop. Yeah, I mean, from a strategic perspective, black should be happy. Um, you have essentially, as you said, a French with the bishop outside the pawn chain. It's a French player's dream. But that doesn't tell the whole story because the bishop on g4, in some cases, can actually end up as a bit of an awkward piece. For example, if you play yeah. knight f5 in this position, which is the kind of stock you know, typical French move, 
white could respond with h3 and suddenly you're forced to give the bishop up for the knight because bishop h5 obviously runs into the pawn fork g4 and if you have to yep. give up the bishop for the knight okay i'm not sure you're a huge fan of that and i think we're going to see that on the board h3 bishop takes f3 knight takes f3 david anton will probably put his queen on b6 and we might get a very, very sharp middle game here as Ralph Mamedov tries to keep his pawn center together and might even sacrifice the B2 pawn as he tries to do that. Well, he's going for it now because he'll he'll have no choice but to give up one of the pawns, whether that's the D4 pawn or the B2 pawn. Black yeah. is now bringing pressure. Uh, a very, very dreamy French position. But as you pointed out, that lack of a light square bishop can also come back to haunt Black in different ways. That's exactly right. And in the meantime, I think we have a very spicy position in Lazovic versus Nakabura. We basically called it, Danny. Hikaru doing exactly what we thought he would do. Fian Kettoing his dark squared bishop and then getting as unbalanced of a position as humanly possible. The problem is that he's also much worse. He's got an unbalanced yep. position. Congrats. Check, you know, check the box. But it's also plus one in White's favor. Yeah, but this is what we said, right? When you're facing must-win territory as black, you're literally choosing between poisons, right? Playing mainline theory at the highest level always allows for lines that are just known to be four straws, almost in any opening these days, right? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be too general with that, but the truth is the reason you see these types of approaches when players are in must-win territory as black is because whether it's E5, what do you got Berlin? Sicilian, you can get Rosalimos and, and all types of variations that are very forcing, even main lines mm -hmm. of the Nine So you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't, when you lose with the white pieces to start a mini match. So I'll say this, as far as must win territory goes, I agree that Hikaru was just worse, but this isn't the worst must win territory no. he's been he's been in before. And the engine often overestimates these types of structures because now yes. that Hikaru has just played the move E5, we have more of a King's Indian structure. And Dennis Lazovic actually does not want to allow this closed center position, which I totally understand. The computer often gives like a plus one advantage, but yep. sometimes it overestimates it. It can be a little bit myopic when it comes to Black's kingside attack. So Dennis Lazovic, maybe he'll play the move E5 here. I'm really attracted to the move E5 in this position because... If black has to play D takes E5, and I don't really see an yeah. alternative, you get a queen trade, you get a capture on E5. Denis Lazovic is thinking exactly along those lines. This is the luxury of being able to make a draw. You can essentially guide the game in the direction that you want. A6, okay, knight B to D4 looks pretty good. I think if Dennis plays knight back to C3, uh, Hikaru will castle queenside and try to trade on his own terms. I still think that's an equal endgame, but at least you get a little bit more meat on the bone there. Yeah, I agree. I'm going to I'm gonna quickly analyze what you said, because I think it's actually a really instructive point in terms of how to play for must-win chess here. In this position, after E5, a lot of players, I think, would say, okay, if I'm only playing for a draw, it's okay for the position to be closed, but that would have been the opposite of what you want. Despite the computer saying white is doing great, you're giving black a free role in a closed position to slowly expand and maybe build up an attack. So this is a really, really heads-up play to not allow the closed position, despite what the computer says, and to force the game down a much more, a much more just direct path with the pieces being traded mm -hmm. so forgetting about the engine eval engines love positions where you have space and comfort i think that from a practical perspective dennis made the right choice but to your point you know here goes hikaru he's castling queen side and he might uh, not even trade queens if you take here maybe he finds a way to just not take the pawn and keep the queens on the board no but he did i mean ed6 queen d6 is on the board danny and I, at first i i was with you i think oh this is just an equal end game but no actually i think black probably has the upper hand um, if the queens are traded. I, I actually now kind of have soured a little bit on Dennis's position because wh why? Because black has this bishop on g7. That's an incredibly powerful bishop. And after the queens are traded, white's got that pawn on c4. Uh, that's going to be a long-term weakness. Black's rook could even slide yeah. over to c6. And remember that white can't easily play the move b3. You would love to play b3 and connect your pawns but you're always going to experience problems with that knight on c3. So Dennis is actually pausing here. You know, I'm not convinced that he's so happy with that end game. I do think that he should trade queens here. I don't think that he should keep queens on the board because his king uh, is quite compromised. But 
Yeah, he's got his work cut out for him here. Hikaru definitely has chances in this end game. Well, as much as much of an uphill task as it is to win on command with Black, if you were to choose, you know, one player in the world to have to do that, <laughs> Hikaru is at the top of the list, right? Obviously, you think of Magnus, you think of Hikaru right after for a reason. So, I agree with you. The more we look at it, despite my my applauding of Dennis not just going for the closed position, Hikaru is. Uh, giving himself the best possible chances. Look, objectively, White should be okay here. He only needs a draw, but the more this game goes, Hikaru's going to defend this pawn, or maybe he'll just take mm. and really make sure that he's got enough of an imbalance to squeeze here. I think he has to try, as you're saying, Danny. Knight takes g5, bishop takes g5, and bishop takes c3, ruining White's queenside pawn structure. Of course, you're trading more pieces, and you're getting the game closer and closer potentially to a draw, and he's got to figure out uh -oh. a way to develop his knight. No, knight back to d8. Hikaru feeling that no, bishop takes c3, probably traded too many pieces for his taste. But yeah. this is a very artificial way to keep pieces on the board. Knight to d5, bishop to f4, and this is already looking pretty nasty for black. Hikaru yeah. taking a huge gamble here, and I think it's about to backfire. I think it already has. I agree. I'm going to analyze what you just pointed out because as much as it did trade a few pieces, I'm with you that taking here, taking on C3, ensuring that you now have enough of an imbalance to play for developing the knight. What's funny is I can also understand Hikaru's perspective, and this shows you the difficult task of playing for a must-win as black. It's like, what was he choosing? Even this, as much as this is horrible for, for white, like, are you really betting that Black is going to win this endgame? I mean, I, I don't know, right? So from, from the perspective of what Hikaru was choosing, this is why it's not ideal to lose with White in the first game. Yeah, especially against someone like Lazovic. I mean, you can see how he's playing. He's just trying to get all the pieces off the board. And that's yeah. a surprisingly effective strategy. Okay, what do you do now? Now you can't play c6 because of knight b6 check and bishop f4, which picks off the rook on d6. White's next move is essentially pre-moving bishop f4. And I mean, yeah. just visually, you can tell that Hikaru is in massive trouble here. Uh, he needs a big mistake from Dennis. He needs a, a, an anxiety mistake from Dennis in the next couple yeah. of moves. If he doesn't get one, he's very likely to go down in flames in this game as well. Knight f6, but okay. Oh, Dennis has a huge tactic here. Bishop f4, rook d7. Then you take everything on c7, and you have knight takes f7 at the end of the line. I think he spotted oh. it. Wow. Wow. All right, we got to analyze that again. We're going to stay right here. This is maybe Hikaru Nakamura's chessable huge masters. This is it. If, if Dennis spots this, bishop f4, rook d7, Danya's tactic... Everything gets traded on C7, and you sacrifice Bang. temporarily on F7. Boom, goes the dynamite. Rookie 7, and after takes, White has a rook and a couple pawns for the two miners and really is in no danger of losing this endgame. Exactly. Uh, this could be... Exactly. This could be what the doctor ordered. We'll see if Lazovic spots it. He's played Bishop F4. Hikaru's on the clock, oh, and he okay, sacrifices but... the exchange to avoid this. Yeah, but this is, I mean, this is complete desperation. Um, bishop to e5, maybe Dennis can get away with that, but I would just go rook e2. The Dennis Lazovic approach is just to play practically rook to e2, guard, guard the b2 pawn. Are you really worried about knight takes f4, g takes f4? Absolutely not. There is no reason that Dennis should lose this game now. In a classical game, in a regular blitz game in a title Tuesday, he would be playing for a win here with White. He would never uh, accept a draw in such a position with White. Of course, I, paradoxically, it can actually add some pressure when all you need is a draw because that's when you start feeling the nerves and you start feeling the proximity to a huge result. But Dennis has to keep his composure, has to keep some time on his clock. And I'm voting rookie two and then get your other rook into the game, Danny. I cannot fathom how Black ever wins a position like this. He's simply down an exchange. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm with you, although, again, I've unfathomed it before, and Hikaru yeah. has pulled it off, but in this particular case, it's a little different when your opponent is also playing with house money, right? They only need a draw. It's a lot easier to force something out of nothing when three results are on the table. And in, in this particular case, 
all Dennis has to do is uh, is strangle the life out of the position. Okay, he does go for Bishop E5, which which was the best move according to oh. the computer. Although it is Steps a complicated kiss. one after F6. Well, F6, Bishop D4. F6, Bishop yeah, D4. And the yeah. point is the pawn is pinned. And Knight C6, there's Rook A to D1. This is actually what he was spending time trying to figure out. This is filigree precision for Dennis Lazovic. He's got this in the bag. I mean, I just... He cars out of out of chances. Bishop D4. C5 is, a, is an attempt to deflect the bishop, but... Simply rook ac1. Rook ac1, b6, and maybe you even have bishop take c5 there, just like ending the game. I mean, really, anything yeah. at all should be winning here. Simplifying the position after rook ac1, b6, bishop takes c5. If everything is yeah. traded, and in the end, black has to play knight c7, here comes rook e7. And uh, Dennis Lazovic is moments away from sending Hikaru Nakamura to Division Two in the Chessable Masters, our first event of the 2024 Champions Tour. So look at the drama. Look at what's going on. I uh, I vote we head over to the bird's eye view real quick oh, just to take a it. peek. Oh, he's done it. This Let's is, do this it. Is Let's do it. Simplification kills the cat. Again, or is it curiosity? I remain confused. But... Dennis is uh, is taking us down that direction. We can see we've got all five games underway. Go to chess.com slash events if you haven't already. Pull up all the games yourself so you can yell at us in chat about the action we're missing. Um, I would go anywhere you want to go, sir. Oh, let's, I mean, Peter Svidler's game is really heating up. David Anton versus Mamedov. I think Ralph Mamedov is very, very close to essentially scoring a knockout against David Anton. Um, I also wanted to check the Wesley versus Keimer game, where I think Wesley has things under complete control as well. Um, I can't even decide. So many interesting games, Danny. So many I'm interesting games. I'm with you. Well, let's let's go to Wesley So and, and Vincent Keimer okay. just to take a quick peek and remind everybody that Wesley So was the other fortunate player to have won with black, which means he only needs a draw right now as white, and he's probably just just on his way to getting a win at this point with a great a great starting position. Okay, G6 by Vincent. He succeeded in getting something resembling an unbalanced position, but it's essentially unbalanced in one, in one direction. <laughs> White has an attack and black doesn't. So in that sense, it's unbalanced. Um, F5 in this position yeah. looks really juicy. Basically just Super. going for checkmate. No, but this is just terrible for black. Super simple. Uh, it looks like a great starting position for Wesley. He plays it without much thought, also milking a little bit of a time advantage. That's the kind of thing you like. And... Uh, and we think we think Wesley so it will get at least a draw here. Let's head over to the I guess the next biggest name in the game after Nakamura and So. You think of Ferruja perhaps here. Ali Reza won with white, only needs a draw with black. This one is is a little more double edged. Those uh those pawns have extended from home here. So maybe Yu Young Yi will have some long term chances if this can get under time pressure. Yes, I mean, he's got this diagonal. He can drop his queen back to d3. Uh, on the other hand, black always has bishop f5. Um, black yeah. can even play bishop f5 in this position. And in fact, that's what I would do. Um, just yeah. go for the bishop trade. No, but this is a completely equal position. I think, yeah, I agree. The open king maybe affords white some chances in, let's say, a bullet game. But Ali right. Reza, with three and a half minutes, I mean, queen g7 is possible. Bishop f5 maybe runs into queen d5 check. Um, and I would guess that that's what he's calculating, but no, this is. I think Ali Reza has this in the in the bag as well. I I don't see Yu Yangi pulling out a, a win here. Yeah, super tough position to create something out of nothing. Again, what you wish you could do is just keep the exact same position and get both players under a minute, right? As Danya said, in a bullet game, it's a lot harder to navigate the potential tactics when your king is completely naked over here on the king side. But with this much time, you would think Ali Reza. We'll find enough accurate moves. And if those bishops or queens get traded, if either either of those get traded and we head toward a major piece rook ending just over. So, all right, we quickly flash 
The position, wait, just to get an update. Yeah, Dennis Lazovic still in complete control against yeah. Sakura Nakamura. Over. That rook on h6 is ugly A. No, that's it. B4. This is a winning on the spot because B5 is coming. Hikaru cannot prevent his, his minor pieces from getting entrapped on the sixth rank. He's resigned. Lazovic wow. wins the second game. Wow. What a result. 2-0. He didn't even need a draw. He just crushed Hikaru out of the opening two games in a row. Takes a confident swig of water. We always joke players only do that when they're winning and it's going their way. A chess yeah. player's favorite thing to do, a confident swig of water. Dennis Lazovic, the youngster, continuing to make a name for himself, gets the job done against Hikaru Nakamura, the legend. Jumping wow. to the next game we haven't looked at. Whoa, we have. This is over. Whoa, this is crushing. Is... What happened in this game? I saw Black King was on B6 five moves ago, and this doesn't look any better. Well, we kind of called it, Danny. It's the lack of the light square bishop for Black that, paradoxically yeah. enough, is responsible for Black not being able, for instance, in this case, what you wouldn't give to have a, a light square bishop on G6 or on E8. Right. Bebin Anton is... I mean, collecting pawns on the queen side while Rome burns. Queen takes f7 and rook b1. I mean, this game is a couple moves away from just ending in total devastation for the Spanish Grandmaster, who has this incredibly risky style. So he does lose games like this from time to time. Uh, rook b1 immediately. This is also good. It's resign yep. time for David. And he's got less than 20 seconds to go rook with it. Quick. Yeah, quickly keep it going. But yeah, rook c2 just picks off the bishop. At any moment, you could probably take f7 for good measure. But uh, perhaps the human thing to do is he doesn't even want to risk it. He plays rook c2. The bishop is going to fall. We expect the final moments of this one to be near. David Anton is uh, is like, well, that backfired. You know, really wow. wish I had the light squared bishop right now. <laughs> and he lets and his he timer out. It's over. It's over. Time runs out. We go back to the, the well, there's two matchups still going. Wesley So and Vincent Keimer, Yu Yongi, Ali Reza Faruja. Mamedov has sent Antone to D2, Division 2. Lazovic has sent Hikaru to Division 2. And uh, there's also the Svidler game, Danny. Yeah, the Svidler game as well. I actually don't have that up right now. Okay, there we can. I think it's it's one down. Struggling a little bit to get that oh, one okay. up. We're gonna stick right here, or let's go to the Wesley Sokheimer game while we get that get that figured out. But okay, well, what's going on here? What's going Wesley on here? So Whoa! I'm trying to get my bearings here. Vincent Keimer, Vincent Keimer has managed to create some counterplay, Danny. Look at this. He's got a rook on d8. Wait a second. This is actually getting a little bit too dicey for Wesley So's taste. Yeah, definitely dynamic. Still a three-result position, which is all you can ask for when you're in must-win territory. Accurate move from mm. Wesley. Accurate moves from Wesley include moving the queen to e2. e3. e2 wouldn't have been ideal because of knight to d4. Okay. Bishop F8 yeah, is a great is... move by Vincent to stop Queen H6, which would have traded Queens, Danny. Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh-oh. Queen H4 is a mate threat. Vincent has to play King G8, I think, and meet Queen H4 with Queen D4 check. He can't play Queen D4 check immediately because then F7 will fall at the end of the line. No, Vincent has too little time. I don't think he's going to make this happen. Yeah, this is this is looking grim for Vincent. He's got 40 seconds on the clock. King g8 was forced. Bishop e3. What a patient move by Wesley. So bringing out his bishop. But Vincent Keimer, he's still fighting. Finding move after move to keep this game going and keep the position unbalanced. All right, it's imbalanced. He's under a minute. Apologies, trying to get this figured out so we can also take a look at the Spither game if we want. Although if this one's interesting enough, we can stick right here. Your call. Um, can we quickly check the position in? Yeah, let's do Spindler, it. Terza, Pulling Hocken, it up. Just to get our bearings. 
Reminder, okay. Peter Spindler has to win this game as white. Mm, I mean, from an objective standpoint, this is probably closer to equal. Peter is, okay, material is equal, but look at the clock situation. Teresa Hockin with only 11 seconds, basically playing on increment. But it is a pretty simple position. I feel like Black, yeah. Black has a pretty clearly defined plan of action here. We've got a trade on d6. Oh, Rook takes d6 is excellent. Hitting the bishop on a6. And Rook d4. Walked into the fork, but as you pointed out, you hit the bishop, so there wasn't an option. Now Rook d4. Look at this. What great technique here with no time on the clock by Sambel. Bringing the knight to e5 is just, just good stuff. Yes. Knight f2 was also a move. Okay, we can also go back to the Vincent Keimer game. I feel like Sambel has this under control. He should not lose this position with such an active piece tandem. Although, if he if he lets it slip a little bit, I mean, White has this two-on-one advantage over here. I mean, a pass pawn is uh, is in, in Peter's future for sure. And if he can keep the time edge, I don't know. I just have a feeling. I just want to stick here for a few more moves okay. to see if things, hey. <laughs> things, get, things get wild for Peter. I don't want to count Peace Fitty out yet. You know, I've done that. Then he released that album, right? After that. That's right. And called you out in that album, E5 by Svidler. His only <laughs> chance, White's only chance is that past C pawn. And there it is, right? He's pushing C4. He's going to try to squeeze his king into D4. But King C3 might run into Rook A3 check. And I don't think the Rook trade is beneficial for White. Rook H3. What a devilish idea by Peter. Yeah. But his E5 pawn is so yeah. weak. It's so Too weak. Much. And it's dropping. The most likely result here is that Spindler loses trying to win, right? Yes. Because obviously a draw is but, not helpful. Okay. Uh, and he's got some imbalance, but there's too few pawns on the board. I just don't see him generating any practical chances here. Bishop B3. Okay, maybe start pushing the H pawn and hope for a blunder. But no, this is not going to happen. Yeah. Okay, no, well, it's it's... It's difficult to choose in these moments, but we think Sambel should at least get a draw here. So we're going to head back to the other game that is still... Well, there's two other matches Ooh. still going. Ali Mesa Perugia versus Yu Yong Yi, Wesley Sil, Vincent Keimer. Let's go to the Wesley game. I think you, I think Ali Reza has it in the bag. But look at this. This is yeah. actually a little bit double-edged. No, but Wesley also has it in the bag. He's got too too much time, I think, and too too many pawns. Too much time and too many pawns. You know <laughs> how I how I often feel, and not not with the advantage. <laughs> you know my my opponent has too much time and too many pawns. What happened here? Um, Another pawn. Wesley's just going to keep grabbing. At this point, he could even consider taking b7 and pushing f7. Unnecessary. They just agree to a draw. Apparently, Keimer throws in the towel. We quickly head over to Ali Reza Faruja, Yu Yong Yi. Yeah, it wow. looks like Faruja at least drawing this endgame. Remember, that's all he needs. My God, I don't think the players got the memo. I mean, Dennis Lazovic needs a draw. He wins. Wesley So needs a draw. He plays for a win. Ali Reza Faruja needs a draw with the black. And he's essentially outplaying his opponent. He might decline a draw at this point. Rook to D3. And black is winning very straightforwardly here. Rook D3 and King D4. And I think the pawn end games are going to be winning for black. Let's see how Ali Reza finishes it off. Wow, Svidler is still playing. Whoa! Well, Ali Reza okay. gives up the win, but it's still a draw. Yeah, I was going to say it. The eval bar gives you a heart attack, and then you remember the match situation. All Faruja needs is a draw, so that was the very the very practical thing to do. Uh, really nothing Yu Yong Yi can do. He might even just accept his fate right now. Looks like he's about to. Indeed, he does. So we quickly go. To the last matchup again, Peter Spindler okay. is still playing. Whoa, 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 whoa. And Black has to give up the knight for White's remaining pawn. Okay. If Spindler can get to Black's okay. two pawns, you get Rook and Bishop versus Rook. But can he this do is... that? Well, look, when your opponent only has five seconds, they are quite literally living Bishop off the increment. D4. He's uh, blundered I'm... one of them. Here we go. Peter Spindler. Peace, Vinny. Oh, my Let's God. Let's do it. But can he get to that last pawn? Danny, in my experience, when you have a situation like this with that remaining F pawn, it's actually yeah. very, very hard against proper defense to actually win that pawn. Yeah. Peter is trying, though. 
And that's the right attitude if you're black. You shouldn't settle to just, well, king and rook versus king, rook and bishop is a draw. You should do everything you can to hold on to that pawn and just make it impossible. You're more likely to get a repetition right here, honestly. And as we've always and said, it's F very hard to hold that end game with no time. And at some point, you could even sack your rook for the bishop on d5, but you don't want to rush it. King h3, and I think you can do it now. Rook d5. Rook d5 and king g2 is a draw. He's calculating it, and he's yep. going to do it. He's going to do it. He sees it. Yep. And he's, he's done it. it. And sacrifices the rook. That is a heads-up play. Peter Spiddler's Division One hopes come to an end. And that... Is our first round of match play in the books. That's how you have it. Sambel Tursahakian moves on. Denis Lazovic moves on. Ralph Mamedov, Ali Reza Faruja, and Wesley So all move on to the next round. And uh, and yeah, a very nicely wow. made bed. Looks like a yes. hotel room. Definitely on the a hotel room. Is a chess player's life. Wow, what what a series of matches, Danny. That was amazing. I, I honestly would ask you normally, what was your what was the biggest surprise? What was your biggest takeaway? I think I know the answer, but go ahead and take it away anyway. Well, Dennis Lazovic, he is the man of the hour. Winning that first game right out of the opening, demonstrating such precision, such control technique. It was never out of the question. And then in the second game, not just trying to play for a draw, but actually playing aggressively and outplaying Hikaru from that equal end game to take the second game as well. But also a spotlight on Ralph Mamedov. He's one of my favorites. Yeah. He's got such an enterprising style. So dynamic and such a difficult opponent for anybody to face. He advances with a sparkling victory over David Anton in the second game of their match. Ali Reza Faruja, he takes care of business. And so does the Armenian GM. Who, by the way, I pointed out yesterday, really early in the tournament, Sam Terza Hakian, don't sleep on him because he can yeah. score some upsets. Especially in rapid chess. He's a guy who made a name for himself in the Pro Chess League over the last few years. Someone who just, with an aggressive, just uncompromising style, when you don't have a lot of time on the clock, he is a pain in the rear to face. Uh, again, David Antone chose his opponent in Ralph Mamedov as Hikaru Nakamura did. So as far as higher seeds who might be regretting their choice a little bit, those are the two that go down. Ultimately, Wesley So was last picked for a reason. He showed he showed why nobody wanted to play him, and he took down Vincent Keimer. So, okay. Uh, amazing stuff. Match play will continue. The drama is already very real. We're going to take our first break here in a second, but in, in the meantime, four-time U.S. champion Yasser Serwan. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm throwing to a Yasser reference here. He's got a new Chessable course out. He presents his own winning chess strategies on Chessable, a book that I read as a kid, which was absolutely phenomenal. You should check it out. There's Hikaru in the final moments, but we're going to take our first break when we return. It's more match play. The Chessable Masters continues in a few.
Our once magnificent kingdom of chess lays now in ruins, our king slain. But some say that a new ruler will come and restore the realm to its former glory. Solve puzzles, fight epic battles, and earn gold, swords, and scrolls full of chess wisdom on your way to reclaiming the throne. Download the app today. And this month only, face off against your favorite kingdom character bots. Only on chess.com. Hello, can I get 50 elo back, please? Because one of my friends played on my account and lost 50. Thank you. I've got friends like that too. When I'm frustrated or in a bad mood, <laughs> something or strikes. Maybe my friends, a little they... bit, you know what? Maybe a little, maybe, you know, I don't know. It's been a good night. <laughs> yeah. Now I have friends just like that, man. They, they come on my account. I wake up in the yeah. morning. Yeah. Well, the good news is um, better to have friends who lose you rating points than gain you rating points because then your account might be closed for cheating. Pro tip. I am deeply sorry for the language I used. I will never ever ever use vulgar language again. I'm sorry, please, unban me, please. You are my star and my sunshine. <laughs> I go to bed dreaming of you and when I wake up I think of you again so I ask kindly please chess.com come with me to POM. Hugs and kisses. We love you too. Unmute that man. We love you too. I love all members. I feel like we were being taunted just a little bit there. Um, but at the same time, I'm not one to judge anyone's speech impediment, you know? And so, welcome, welcome, you whiskily wabbit. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. And, and it's a gaming site. You know, when people write in and they've got the right sense of humor, it means a lot to us. Because, you know, yeah, that's that's sure. the kind of um, the Good vibes stuff. we want.
We are back. The first match play round is in the book. Some amazing upsets, some incredible games. Donya Naroditsky here alongside Danny Wrench taking you through day two of our placement round here in the Chessable Masters. But all right. We're in day two. There's also a division two and a division three going on. There's so much chess, it's impossible to follow. So just like yesterday, we had Grandmaster David Howell. We are now joined by International Master Tanya Sachdev. You know her, you love her. She is the host of so much that the Champions Chess Tour does. And right now, she's going to help us keep an eye on some of the games we might have missed in the other divisions. Go ahead, Tanya. <laughs> Hi, Danny. Danny, I'm so excited to be here. We started yesterday and it was quite a banger. We had so many turnarounds in the end and we're seeing so many turnarounds in Division 2 and 3 as well. You said, I have to review a game, but I'm going to try and quickly review a match because this was all kinds of shocking. And the one that I want to take you guys to is from Division 2. It really matters to these players to stay in Division 2. It gets them a chance to get to Division 1. So much money on the line. And this is the match that I want to show you guys. Uh, it's Shimonov versus Antipov. Uh, and it starts, uh, this position is where I'm going to start from because this position really complicated. I was following it. And white is down upon, but look at black's king. It's in the center. White has all this peace activity. The knight on g5 and the queen on c4 makes sure that black can't castle and get the king to safety. And now Shimonov makes this move, uh, jumping in with his knight to c5. A really nice move. And here, Antipov played knight b6 hitting the queen and then disaster strikes no this yeah, it, it was shocking i was watching this no. live so you can just what? imagine yeah this no. happened <laughs> and here white makes the move queen to a4 and I, of course that happened, happened. <laughs> it happened. <laughs> okay it's a one move a queen drop a mouse slip and of course antipov immediately gobbled the queen oh. up white has got four minutes on the clock absolute heartbreak and now shimanov has got the task to make a comeback in game two <laughs> with the black pieces and i want to show you a really quick moment about how he managed to do that because again it was all kinds of impressive so i'm gonna just quickly pull that up queen a4 i mean mouse slips it's kind of really difficult to get over that no mind-blowing just Insane. And this is the position that I want to bring your attention to. Now, in this position, Shimonov playing with the black pieces just out of a fresh mouse slip, blundering a queen. Uh, his opponent makes the move c5, trying to open up the sniper of a bishop. I really liked this move, even though it's a cross, I think, from a, from a practical perspective, these kind of moves are really dangerous. Uh, after c5, white this black decides to capture the pawn and just ignore all these computer evaluations of good move, bad move, because it's a really complex position, right? And Shimanov in a must win game here. White takes back the pawn, the bishops open, and after f6, black uh, Shimanov simply blocks down the diagonal, hits the knight, but notice how the knight actually cannot be taken because bishop takes and pawn would then be a check. Winning the queen, lots of arrows, but you get the point, which is why white continued with the move bishop to b5, attacking the rook black simply sidestepped and i think this was the critical moment here because shimano played such a sneaky move it was a little move but with a big threat king to g7 and again notice how the computer gives this across but from a practical perspective i was really impressed with this move because it sets up a really big trap which is so easy to miss and you're going to understand that in just a moment because antipov also missed it. He made the natural looking move here, lifting his rook up one square, simply moving away from this pin. But notice how now the bishop, the king on g7 and not on h8, does a really nice job of actually defending a key f6 square. So now it was possible to grab the piece, bishop takes pawn, the knight comes back, and it's defended by the king. In the earlier line, white could have moved the queen to g5, attacked the knight, and the tactics would have worked out in Antipov's favor. But because of this sneaky move, king to g7, which the computer didn't like, Shimonov actually ends up winning a piece in this tactical skirmish. It doesn't work because now white can't take the queen. Antipov's queen is attacked, and all the tactics work out in Antipov's, in Shimonov's favor. Eventually, it went on to an Armageddon, which again had big tactics, and Shimonov was the winner of this match. A queen slip, king to g7 in a game two, setting up the trap, and eventually taking the match against uh, Antipov. It was quite the comeback one. Wow. Honestly, I, I just keep going back to the mental fortitude to recover from queen a4. Like, that is... That's that's pretty 
pretty mind-blowing stuff there to blunder a queen in literally one move and come back and win. So, all right, awesome stuff. Tanya, I know it's been wild. It's furious, but we're back here on the tour. Are you are you excited? You've been a, you've been a fan of what's happened so far? I'm super excited. I loved day one and the action that's on in the planes as well, not just in Division 1, but there's such exciting games in Division 2. I've been talking about the comeback kid, Shimano. Well, kid, I don't know if I can call him the comeback kid, but the comeback player, but it's not just him. Jeffrey Zhang made a comeback in his match. Alexander Grischuk made a comeback in his match. Daniel Dubov in Division 3 made a comeback in this match, and that's what I love about this format. It's just so unpredictable. I'm really excited, Danny. I love it, Tanya. Great to see you. Of course, you will have the action starting tomorrow with David Howell and Robert Hess. So we'll let you get back to it. You'll keep an eye on Division 2 and Division 3 for us. Tanya and I are going to move into previewing the pairings of our next round. And uh, we'll catch up with you in a little bit. See you later. And good job, guys. I'm on the edge of my seat. I'm going to be following the action. See you later. Bye, Tanya. All right, Tanya. Bye, Tanya. All right, Tanya. Apparently, that <laughs> rhymed. Let's take a look at our matchups here. The players still standing. We also had opponents chosen by the top seeds, from what I understand. Once again, as you see them, Martinez, Napomnishi, Giri, Artemyev all chose their opponents, which makes sense why Sam Sevian is stuck with Wesley So. <laughs> yeah, what an easy pairing. And Dennis Lazovic versus Anish Giri. Can Dennis continue his Cinderella run um, against one of the most solid, one of the most consistent and unupsettable players? in Anish Giri, literally and figuratively. And of course, the matchup of the two dark horses, Jose Martinez versus Sam Veltersa Hakim. Can Jose, the birthday kid, now 25 years old, can he continue that incredible run from yesterday, that form? Man. Gonna be gonna be interesting to see. Again, what one thing that I'm wondering about, you just mentioned form. Let's remind everybody that other than Jospom, the guy who was in great form yesterday, we don't know whether Jan Napomnishi, Anish Giri, Artemyev, and of course Sam Sevian are gonna be on form yet. The moves you're about to see are their chessable masters and their 2024 champions chess tour debut. Uh, they've been on the sidelines, eagerly awaiting, perhaps feeling really good about the fact that they got a pre-seeded spot, given how the format works. But uh, but no more no more watching, no more waiting. It's time to jump no. in, and uh, we'll see if Napalm Nishigiri and the likes of all the other players who are joining for the first time, we'll see if they're on form. Yeah, it's hard to say. Is it a good thing uh, to have that extra round of rest? Or uh, do you prefer to actually play? Because you're more warmed up. You're more, you know, you're more in the heat of the moment. So there's different schools of thought. But either way, uh, the work is cut out for Sam Velter Sahakin. Jose Martinez has some incredible opening preparation, which was on full display yesterday. And this delayed Alapin that he starts with, he's been playing this move almost exclusively this line with h3 and he knows it extremely well it's actually hard to get out of the opening against jose in a decent position when he plays this delayed alipin agreed and it's it's a it's a Weapon, we've already seen him get some quick wins in. I think Samvel Tursahakian, as all the other players are, there, he's aware of this being a system that Jospom is going to play. But uh, that doesn't mean you're you're any more ready to deal with it. It's not, it's not a system with a ton of bite. It's not like White is getting some sort of really deeply prepared theory or, or a position where Black can misstep with one move. But overall, it's a position that Jospom tends to know better than his opponents. And that pays off, especially in fast time controls. And you can already see it here moving instantly. And I like Sam Bell's setup, broadly speaking, these pawns on C5 and E5. It might create a bit of an awkward impression, but at least he's preventing Jose from grabbing control of the center with D4. But clearly, yeah. Jossman's still in his preparation. He trades on F6, so he gives up the bishop pair, but he gives it for positional considerations. He's got the light square control. Um, that light square bishop is on a really prime location. The knight... Uh, Rui Lopez style, as you're showing, Danny. This is a very Rui Lopez-esque structure. Yeah. And Sam Bell, I think, has to compensate by orchestrating some kingside play, maybe moving his king to the side and quickly trying to play it King's Indian style with F7, F5. I actually love the way the Armenian GM is handling this opening. 
I agree. I, I was going to say, we, we we're complimenting Jospam. He plays these systems as white. He's still playing quickly, so you would you would, you would would assume in some level of prep. But I actually love Black's chances in a position like this because, yes, white has this positional advantage, as as we you already highlighted, a very Rui Lopez-esque advantage. But here comes Black. Black has the bishop pair. Black has a structure that easily supports expansion on the king side. And if, if you're looking for a three-result position, this is what the doctor ordered. And I'm I'm actually thinking that Sambel can't be unhappy at all about the opening in this game. Well, hopefully Jose wasn't out too late yesterday. Uh, it was <laughs> his birthday. Uh, he did have plans to celebrate with his family and his friends. Um, but we'll see. I mean, Bishop A2, clearly White was preparing the move B2, B4, expanding on the queen side. Samvel says, not on my watch. He pushes A5. And the typical reaction for White here is to play the move A4 and to seize control of the B5 square. But I'm just worried for Jose because the queen side is not where yeah. the party is happening. It's not where the action is at. So White can control all of the squares to his heart's content. But if you get checkmated on the king side, I mean, all of the squares that you control in the center and on the queen side are going to be a moot point. I'm highlighting what it looks like, not just because you know I love coloring books, but because if you, you may not even want to play a four right away, but the point is, if this position becomes a King's Indian type of affair where black has a free roll on the king side because we're super locked up, this can get very dangerous very quickly. Of course, white's intention, if black all in commits, which, okay, we're going to see it, is probably to try to orchestrate a strike in the center to undermine the structure. Often the best defense against a flank attack is to open the game. Pro tip for anyone watching. But I'm I'm excited about where this is going to go. This is about to be one of those kind of games that just has you on the edge of your seat. Black will be yes. all in over here, and and White is going to have to organize defense while trying to open the center to undermine Black's attack. We have a very exciting game in Mameda versus Nepomuchi, which is a really interesting match that I just wanted to spotlight, Danny, because those Let's two players. It. Those two players have faced each other an inordinate number of times, most recently at the 2023 World Cup, where they drew their first two classical games. Jan Pomnishi won that match by the hair on his chinny chin chin, and he doesn't have a lot of hair on his chinny chin chin. They've also <laughs> played at the 2022 World Blitz Championship, 29 World Blitz Championship. They first faced off in the 2005 World Youth Stars, which is a scholastic tournament. So these two players have known and faced each other for the longest of times, and they always get these crazy tactical games. Obviously, Nepo Mamedov, both are incredibly sharp players. Okay, first impression is that Ralph might have bitten off more than he can chew. His center is kind of collapsing uh, here, Danny. What's going on? Uh, such a wild position. We need to analyze this just to see how we got here. Because I'm looking at a pawn on C5, and, uh, uh, you know, the 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 D pawn wasn't advanced to get there. I'm kind of like, what what happened here? We've got this, we've got a Sicilian, a Rossellimo slash Moskva type of variation, which is where the bishop comes to B5. Whether the knights on C6 or the pawns here, that depends on whether it is named Rossellimo or or Moscow. But after a kind of a, a tame looking approach, the position gets super wild here. After Black gives up the bishop pair and White just strikes with B4. Rook g8, what an, what an ambitious Rook move G8. to say that you can just attack the white king and neglect your king in the center. And Nepo's like, okay, you're not going to castle. Well, well uh, here comes the heat, right? I'm just going to blow open this position. I, I think this one could backfire very quickly for my meta. This looks very, well, very spicy. First of all, I think having said Peter, you have to say Paul. He's got to go g4 and basically... Go all in because if he plays D takes C5 now, the problem, and we can put this on the yeah. board, D takes C5, E5, and White's yeah. pawn just acts as a battering ram, just, just yep. slashing through the position. For example, knight to D5, E6, yep. and I mean, just look at how Black's position is completely destroyed by this single pawn. So Mamedov is taking his time. He's been thinking for something like two minutes now, but I think yeah. he's got to go G4. And in the live I, position, I, if he plays G4, Danny, it's going to get crazy. G4 will be met by H takes. And after you take with the knight, I mean, I'm considering if I'm white, just like D4 here. Like, I don't yeah. even need to take another pawn because the more open this position becomes, the more black feels feels the consequences. If it isn't the consequences of my own actions, right? That's what black is about to face. The bishop will come to C4. F7 is a target. This bishop might even come to A3. 
And I'm like, this is why we dealt we tell kids not to neglect their own king safety for an all-out attack. I, again, Mamet of a very strong player, but this whole idea of Rook G8, Nepo is is just licking his lips right now. I, I think he's gonna I think he's gonna blow Ralph off the board. Beyond look by the it's way, D4 is on the board. I'm loving white. Okay, but if I could take the devil's advocate position here, after D takes C five, which has just happened. White center is under a lot of fire, and the obvious move here for white is to push d5, right? This is the move that your hand wants to play. Probably this is the yeah. move that Jan is going to play. But okay, after d5, black has the move knight c uh, onto e5, which is a really nice stronghold for black in the center. And let's not forget that black is ahead in development. Uh, this is a very odd thing to say because black has flouted so many opening rules, but then again, so has white. But currently, yeah. Black has two pieces developed. Black has zero. Now, I'm with you, Danny. I think Ralph's position is extremely dangerous. I think he needs to be ultra precise. Um, but I think that he might be able to manufacture um, some intrigue yet in this position. Maybe a move like Queen to B6 comes to mind in order to prepare C4 and go after that F2 pawn. Um, queen to Barry 6, but also Queen to David 6. Oh, um, Queen to Barry. Okay. Queen to, Queen to sorry, Dennis I miss, miss her B and D. Thank you for doing no, the doing good. the bear or David thing. <laughs> I, <laughs> no I'm with you. I, I'm with you that he's not being blown off the board immediately, but the long term features favor White with the totally. bishop pair. This king, this king still has no safety, yeah. and the fact that the fact that Nepo is also up almost four minutes on the clock already, I think, tells you how both the position players are feeling in this Ooh. position. E6. And, and, and speaking of ne speaking of Nepo and how he's feeling, can we just get a zoom in? To the to the swag real quick. I don't know, I don't know what Nepo woke up with today, but look at that. He's brought the chess.com hoodie, the chess.com mug, rocking the secret lab chair. I just I had to give a shout out to Nepo in the swag attack. Wow, Yana Pamishi fresh off um, his performance in Tata Steel, which was kind of up and down. He played all right, but I'm sure he's happy to be back home. And playing a tournament from the comfort of his uh, of his office. E6 by Ralph Mamedov. That guy is brazen. This is typical <laughs> Ralph Mamedov chess. Tough. Everything is hanging. <sighs> I'm actually curious. Queen F6 is his idea. But Jan could push F3. This move F3 is actually incredibly nasty. Because Black's knight on G4 doesn't have that many places to go. I mean, you don't want to go back to H6. So Jan has not developed a single piece other than his queen. And he actually might not develop any pieces until the rest of, until the end of the game. I mean, who needs their minor <laughs> well, pieces anyway, Danny, right? I, I would argue that half of them are developed where they stand, right? The bishops do That's a pretty true. good job controlling the board when the diagonals are open. So I hear you on that. And again, I'm clearly suffering from some nepo bias. I didn't mean to, but I just, I look at this whole thing and I'm just like, what is going on with Momenta? First of all, I love it. Like, this is the kind of chess you want to see. But what an awkward way to play chess, just completely neglecting the king. I think if Nepo finds F3, this position is just going to continue to have fireworks. And uh, Ralph Momenta averaging three to four shirts eaten a tournament right now. He keeps putting yeah. the shirt over his <laughs> mouth and just keeps eating. I'm like, he's just biting his shirt nervously. I love it. Every player has their tick, and for some players, it's <laughs> they're more destructive than others. You know, for some, it's just fidgeting with a pawn or fidgeting with yeah. their hair. For Ralph Mamedov, it's the whole thing. He's fidgeting with his hair. He's eating his shirt. I mean, he's banging the table, and he might need to bang the table because his position is on the verge of collapse, but it's Ralph. This guy lives life on the edge, on and off he the does. board. Shout out to the Fair Play team in the background. Hi, Mom. Hi, Sean. I love Sean. you. Call me later. There, there's the, there's our, there's our field of vision back there. Oh my gosh. Um, well, I mean, we can go to another game. I feel like this one has had all the entertainment we need. We got Chesscom swag. We got a player eating his fifth shirt of the event. We've got fair play cameras and we've got fireworks on the board, but we haven't checked in on so many other games. I'm just going to, yeah. I'm going to flash to remind everybody um, that, uh, that they can go to chess.com slash events. This is the position currently between Sevian and So. Wesley Danya once again reminding reminding everybody why he is the last person chosen, consistently not someone anyone wants to face in a, in a very, very solid position as Black. 
Yeah, he's just always better. This his default in with any color against any opponent is he's just slightly better. Um, yep. He's been slightly better this entire event, and he's slightly better in this position. He's got a beautiful bishop. Wow. Also, Gary versus Lazovic apparently locked in an interesting battle as well. But Sam Sevian, he needs to tread carefully in this position. Bishop takes f3 is yep. threatened. Bishop on d5 yep. is beautiful. Okay, this middle game is going to go on for a while. I agree. And we can go to the game you just quickly mentioned. I think Geary Lazovic oh. might have a little more spice in store because Dennis Lazovic was one, was chosen by Hikaru Nakamura. He sent Hikaru to Division 2. Anish Geary chose Dennis Lazovic as the opponent, everybody. And Dennis Lazovic is once again flexing his black. I think I think the old guard might reconsider choosing this kid going forward. Yeah, I mean, they're picking on him, and Dennis says, you know what, I'm going to embrace this role. Not just spoiler, not just, oh, I'm going to win a one-off game here and there. He wants to win this this entire thing, and he believes that he can do that. I mean, there was a reason this guy qualified to the CCT Finals in Toronto. Looks like he might be going astray here in his last couple of moves. No question that Dennis is in the driver's seat in this position. Look at how passive, look at how passive Anish Giri's position is. That night on yeah. C5 is aiming at the long-term weakness on D3. But I feel like Anish has more or less stabilized the situation. His position is very ugly, but I don't think Dennis has any clear ways to make inroads. And that's why he just dropped his queen back to D7, just kind of regrouping for a potential second wave of the attack. Completely agree with you, although whether Dennis is winning or not is black, that, that, that would be a feat that would be... Really impressive to do that in back-to-back -back matches, but I think objectively he's doing fantastic as Black. Okay, a couple of missteps, as you said, deciding he's just going to regroup, um, but even a draw would not be the worst result for the youngster uh, to uh, to start off this matchup again. But here comes Geary. Maybe, maybe if this knight has to move, White can start to unwind. Yeah, Black's advantage has just sort of methodically evaporated move by move. I'm not sure I understand Dennis's previous move, Rook to E6. I thought the Rook was perfectly well pl placed on F6. It was pressuring the F3 pawn, but he probably yeah. wants to bring it back to E8 or E7 and, and contest some of this nasty queenside pressure that Anish Giri has been able to orchestrate with his own Rooks. And Anish yeah. maybe will try to get his knight out of the gates here, knight D2 and knight B3 is an idea. Knight D2 is on the board, and the eval bar doesn't like anything that's good. It doesn't like teddy bears. It, <laughs> you know, thinks about hurting kittens. It doesn't kittens. like it's, flowers. It's very evil. Or, uni nope. or unicorns. You know? Yeah. I, yeah not just, I was with you on the eval bar train. Let's 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 beat up the eval bar. We hate you, evil eval bar. That's All right, right. but you're... Gary right. is uh, <laughs> Gary is trying to trade off Black's pressure so that the queen is no longer imprisoned to guarding the d3 pawn. And I I wonder if Dennis should have just traded and simplified. Now Gary can slide the queen over or even consider c5 to keep some space here. This is interesting. It, it could start to turn around. Yes, but on the other hand, Anish is really abandoning his own king. So Dennis, first of all, should probably put a rook on b8 just to kind of, again, just to contest White's pressure on the queen side. So I would start yeah. with the move rook to b8. That's a very Lazovic type move. Later yeah. on, rook b8 is on the board. That knight on b3 is kind of awkward. If it moves back to d2, L Lazovic could jump his own knight into c5. Let's not forget the d3 pawn is a long-term target. The second thing I'll point out is that White's king is kind of all alone so later in the game maybe black can go for f7 f5 but if so then that's way in the future because right now this is not a very feasible plan white's got that queen on a2 that's x-ring black's king and the position continues to heat up maybe you could play h5 and try to shatter uh -huh. white's king side that way i don't know this is a very complex position you stole my thunder. I was going to go full alpha zero and suggest exactly that plan because you highlight the king is alone. And this pawn is on g3, right? Pawns can't move backward very good, I've heard. So h5, h4. And and now white is uh, a little frustrated, especially with this queen able and happily sliding over on the sixth rank if you give her a chance. So, uh, okay. I like Dennis Lazovic's chances here. 
That move maybe not super accurate. Mutual time pressure will also be interesting in this matchup. I don't know that either of these players are particularly known for their bullet or mouse skills, but if we get <laughs> mutual time scrambling, then uh, I guess we'll find out whose nerves are best today, at least. Okay. Really interesting position. We interesting positions all around. All around. I... I'm going to go back to the game that had our fancy to start. I, I know we haven't checked in the others. Reminder, you can go to chess.com slash events if you want. That's why this is exciting. We are spoiled for choice. Yonda Pomnishi currently up a piece, and White's position is still pretty good, like we left it. White's completely winning, and you called it. Yeah. I mean, this entire opening operation, it was interesting, it was entertaining, but ultimately it backfired, and... Maybe Mamedov was okay if he played with computer precision, but right now he can take on E3, but then White will have two pieces for a rook, and what Black's yeah. king is all alone. The knight from D2 is coming into F3. This game is over. Jan, Jan yep. Pomnishi is not going to let this one slip. And yeah, the other thing I, I called earlier was that the time was revealing. Jan was up four minutes when we left it. He's still up four minutes now, and Mamedov is uh, down to the wire. Now if he doesn't take, he may lose his chance. White's going to put the knight on D4 unpinning the rook on e3 uh he does it rook h6 is nothing you can just play queen g3 i think we're about to see this one be over so where do you want to go next artemia well, uh, yes that game is heating up you read my mind danny um Let's i'll also it. point out that wesley it continues to outplay sam sevian but that game hasn't changed all that much so maybe we can go back yeah. to that one a little bit later this game the center has blown open and look at what's happening now. Ali Reza Ferruja has jumped out and has the initiative after being worse for most of the first part of the game. Now it feels like Black is very much in the driver's seat. Yeah. Okay. The queens, queens, have been queens have been traded. Pawns are equal in terms of total material, but Black's deep pawn is passed. It's also isolated. So here comes Artemiev, who enters the Chessable Masters for the first time. Remember, he was one of the players preceded into the second round of divisional placement. Um, and uh, and yeah, um, he's down on the clock, though. What is Perugia's plan to guard the deep on and keep his chances alive? Remember, these are two game mini matches. As as uh, as we've already seen, we didn't get a single arm regret and tiebreaker in the first round. By the way, Donnie, we didn't even talk about that. That's kind of funny. We didn't get a single a single match go to Armageddon. We'll see if that trend continues. Wow, that's just how combative these matches are. Something tells me that we will get at least one Armageddon in this second round of matchups. But again, we never know. By the way, it's official. Jan Nepomnishi, um, our first result. It's a decisive one. Nepomnishi crushes Ralph Mamedov who will need to win on demand with the white pieces. It feels like this game is fizzling out. D4, knight takes D4, now bishop takes E5. Okay, also this, this is a draw. Everything is traded. Okay, yeah. Ali Reza has a smidge of an advantage because the bishop in the open board is going to be a little bit better than the knight. But Vladislav Artemyev is not the kind of guy who typically loses these sorts of end games. Rook B6 is very accurate. And we might see bishop D4, rook D4, bishop takes G2. Uh, which is one way of making a draw, a fancier way of making a draw. But this game is going to end in peace. I'm 99% sure of that, Danny. Agreed. And I misspoke in saying that we had two game matches. We will have four game matches in this second round of play. We started off with two game matches, yep. but with the preceded players entering the fold, we get a little more at stake here with four games to be played, which means winner of each match requires two and a half points now, not one and a half. I'm with okay. you that I would be shocked if we don't have at least one matchup go to Armageddon, though. So from that perspective, I, I still think we're gonna get we're gonna get some very closely contested chess here. Um okay, you already pointed out Yana Pomnishi won against Ralph Menov. This one is likely to be a draw. We could check in with well, the top seed from the play-in in the Swiss, Jospam, Jose Martinez, the birthday boy of yesterday, in a, okay, this in is a, a position draw. where all pawns remain. That's the highlight here. Not a single pawn wow. has been traded. <laughs> I, but I think this is just a locked-up position. But 38 seconds for Jose. That bishop yeah. on b3, is that bishop trapped? Probably not, because it's threatening to emerge via a4, but now it is kind of trapped. Yeah. 
But what but a it's ridiculous the position. What is a the ridiculous position. Rook e8. Like, rook e8 traps the knight. Rook a3 rook traps, e8 the traps the bishop. But rook a3, yeah, rook e8. Rook a3, bishop c2, rook c1, an eye for an eye is what we're about oh to my see. God. And Jose might actually be better here if the knight is traded for the bishop. And by the way, he can play knight takes g5 and, and yeah. throw the knight away for a pawn. I would play knight takes g5 and then rook a3. He doesn't. And as locked up as the position is, it's not actually a dead draw. Maybe black can set up a fortress with, I don't know, bishop d8 and b6. But I'm actually not totally sure how to make that happen. Jose also has his other knight, Danny, that will eventually emerge from f3. And it can circle around to d5. This is really, really nasty for black all of a sudden. Totally agreed. Uh, what a weird position this was. And B, oh, B5. I was going to say, will we get something what desperate? Black knows. Black knows he doesn't want to go for something super close. So he's trying to force force complications. By the way, that's an incredible point move. out that if, if, mm -hmm. if Rook takes B3, B4, and the Rook is trapped on B3. Dude, B5 is an incredible move. If you play A takes B5, Black plays A4, you have to go for this line. And now the Rook is arrested. You might have to play wow. d4 at some point to extricate yeah. the rook. I think it's just a draw. I think this was the way, the only way, for black to secure a draw cleanly because now it's literally just a mutual fortress. There's no way forward, and this is just a draw. I would ignore the point three evaluation. That's just the computer yeah. being stupid. Completely agree. And uh, computer. speaking of computer being stupid, I feel like we missed the mark and not calling b5 a brilliant move. What an absolutely, absolutely. What an absolutely stunning move move b5 anything else where you give up this bishop white has yeah, the slow potential iffy. to grind yeah it's iffy and we by the way we still have one game going but this this was an incredible save there at the end by yeah. sam veil b5 in time pressure he makes the draw with the black pieces a great result in the first game but again it's a four game match this is a marathon not a sprint it looks like wesley so has defeated sam said yeah, with say. black in the first game we we had games going, but but now I think they're all in the books. Wesley So beat Sevian, Ferugia and Artemiev draw. Nepo already beat Momentov, as we know. Geary and Lazovic have ended the first game of their match peacefully. And Jospam and Sambil Tursayakin, as we can see, draw. So once again, it feels like it's over right right when it starts, Danya. Yeah, these games, they're so fast paced. Ten plus two is a lovely time control. It's a great balance because you get the time scrambles, you get the fast-paced action, but you actually have enough time to play a really high-quality game, which I think Yana Pamnushi and Wesley So demonstrated Wesley's game. We didn't necessarily do it justice, but it was a great positional effort. Yana Pamnushi, eye for an eye, punishing Ralph Mamedov's speculative opening play and off to a great start in their mini-match. Completely agreed. Uh, I, I think Mamedov might be a dream opponent for Jan Nepomnishi as long as Jan is, is on form because Mamedov doesn't know anything but one speed, which is insanity. Speed insanity is what Ralph Mamedov loves to do. And if Nepo is on form, he's just going to say, come at me, big fella, because a player of Nepo's class knows how to win against wild openings like that. That was, that was a ton of fun. Uh, all right. Other than Nepo getting the dub, as you pointed out, Wesley So versus Sam Sevian was not a match that we gave a ton of time to, but Wesley So is the last person chosen in this format for a reason, and he gets the job done winning with Black for the second match in a row. Yeah, he seems to have adopted the kind of boa constrictor mode today that makes him so scary. I mean, this is the kind of Wesley So that won the CGC in Toronto, when Wesley gets that confidence and he starts winning game after game with both colors, you know, he's essentially unstoppable. So Sam Sevian, he needs to stem the bleeding. Now let's re remember, very important, Danny, this is a four game match. So if you've lost the first game, that doesn't mean that you need to burn all of your bridges, particularly with the black pieces. Sam Sevian should play it safe. He should try to be solid with black. Now pounce on any opportunities if you get them, but don't go crazy trying to win game two and dig yourself into a 2-0 hole from which it's yeah. virtually impossible to emerge with, against someone like Wesley. Completely agree. For those who lost, this this next round is a bit of a stop the bleeding round. Don't go down 2-0. We are now in four game matches here. 
On the second day of the divisional placement round, we had the play in Swiss. We now have match play. Tomorrow, players like Magnus Carlsen, MBL, and Fedoseev join the fold. The format is one that everyone has talked a lot about, which is why we continue to do everything we can. Huh. Well, that didn't work out well. Uh, about as about as complicated to figure out our audio issues here as the format itself. But Danya, <laughs> we're back and we're getting ready hey. for the next round of play. Uh, all right. So you talked about the mindset of the losers, uh, meaning respectively Ralph Mamedov as well as Sam Sevian. Everyone else is kind of just getting started, right? Shaking off the uh, the rust for those who just entered the play. Shaking off the jitters, if you're someone like Vladislav Artemiev, Jan Napomnichy, I mean, we talk about it. It's a balance. You're more well-rested, so you come in with a clear head. On the other hand, you didn't have the benefit of yesterday's tournament, so you're maybe not quite as warmed up. You're qu not quite as tactically sharp, which is, I think, why we saw Vladislav Artemiev kind of managing the risk, playing a somewhat quieter, less risky game, but still a great result for Ali Reza Faruja, holding with the black pieces, and I'm really curious what Ali Reza will be able to do against the ultra-solid Artemiev with the white pieces. It's going to be a really interesting second game. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Artemiev is a guy who maybe isn't as quickly known as guys like Anish Giri, Young and yeah. the entering the fold. Even Sam Sevian, I guess, if you're uh, someone who's been following the Young American's career for a long time. But Artemiev is a is an absolute monster, an absolute beast, especially in rapid and online play. We've, we've been following him for more than a decade. And uh, and yeah, he's not someone who is who is not capable of beating Ferrugia. So yeah, I mean, we are go <laughs> going to dive in. Okay. We've, uh, we've got all the choices we want, as usual. Jan Napomnishi, Ralph Mamedov. I've got that one pulled up. We can also switch over to Sambel. Tursa Hakin versus Jospam. Maybe we'll start there. Okay. Then we have a fairly standard Bogo Indian structure. That's the classic pawns on B6, A5, and B4. You essentially only get that out of one opening. You get that out of the Bogo Indian. And yeah. Jose is just, it really cannot be emphasized enough how well prepared he is with both colors against D4 and E4. It, it gives him such a big boost in most blitz tournaments and most rapid tournaments. He's usually up a minute, at least, out of the opening, and this is no exception. He's up a minute in a comfortable spot as black. Uh, the You say Bogo Indian, and I'm looking at the night on A6, but even as someone who plays a Nimzo and has to be aware of these different Bogo and Queen's Indian transpositions, I'm actually struggling to figure out the move order. So I'm just going to quickly roll through it in my head. Selfish chess player educating himself here. Just want to see how we got here. Okay, knight f3, and then the bishop before check with c5 line. Okay, I'm all cut up now, everybody. Thanks for being patient. I feel better. My pleasure. Your wish is my command. And queen out to e2. Okay, I think traditionally white is maybe a tiny bit better. The computer usually likes white space advantage. On the other hand, black has very, very nice central control. And black is a very clearly defined plan of pushing e5 and staking his claim in the center. And if yeah. after e5, white pushes d5, black gets this monster c5 square. The knight on a6 is easy to cast away as a bad piece, but it's actually not a bad piece at all. It's protecting the b4 yeah. pawn. And it's ready to jump into the action if the c5 square opens up. Yeah, it's a fantastic point. It's also out of the way of the bishop on b7. Mm -hmm. So basic principles say a knight on the rim is grim, right? Or dim, or chances are slim. I honestly don't know. As long <laughs> as it rhymes, the knight over here is usually not a great piece. But in terms of the overall functionality of the position it's actually pretty good for black you stay out yeah. of the way of the bishop you actually stay out of the way of the c file you're not fighting the other knight for squares and you're protecting before 
So a very comfy and cozy position for Jospin here. Comfy and cozy is a good way to put it. Shall we uh, keep moving around the horn? I think Jose has basically stabilized out of the opening. We have this Wesley versus Sevian game that I see you have your eyes on. Yeah. Um, okay, this has just started. So this is another Nimzo Indian and a very and traditional Nimzo Indian. I was going to say, it's the classical Nimzo we see played a lot. And there are a lot of variations in this particular Nimzo that can go to a force draw. Okay, B6 is an option there for black, one that one that sometimes brings up the idea of this diagonal being under fire. Hmm. But okay, not in this particular move order because the C7 palm is hanging. Uh, Wesley takes a pause here. I'm now out of my depth as the pauses in my voice are revealing, Danya. <laughs> I, I was out of my depth on move two. I mean, once G6 was not played and E6 was played, all right, that's yeah. basically all I know. Of course, I play the Nimzo Indian as my backup opening, but I don't know much about it. All I know is that Sam Sevian is preparing E5. And the big question yeah. is, can you get away with E5 in this position? The obvious answer is no, because white can respond with D5. But there's a lot of tactics in that position. Maybe black can push E4. And this is exactly what you want if you're Sam Sebi yeah. in a sharp tactical battle right out of the opening, and E5 is on the board. He does it, D5, and D5 E4. can be met with E4. Everything's under fire. The B2 pawn, the knight on F3, the knight on C6, the queen can take E4. Wow. This is an absolutely crazy position. Who's gonna Who's going to be more deeply prepared between the two? I don't know. But I am going to say something, Danya. As fun as these classical Nimzos look, I'll be the cynical one in the room for a second. I feel like they are often very, very forcing draws, and both oh, players yeah. just have it prepared to the end. There's, It's totally true. I mean, first of all, in this position, <clears throat> bishop to f5 uh, is, I think, an even more ambitious attempt, although we might see queen takes b2. You're absolutely right, Danny. A lot of these just end in perpetual checks, like queen takes b2. The computer yeah. is giving the line, like rook d1, queen c3 check. Rook d2, queen c1 check. And chess will oh. always find a way to fizzle out into a draw, no matter how exciting it looks. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, now you're really being cynical. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think, a little do bit we cynical. even know objectively that chess is a forced draw? We always say that, but even the computers and neural nets don't here always play chess to a draw. I okay. might be cynical, but I think we're getting this exact <laughs> perpetual check. And people looking at this might be like, why is Sam Sevian going for a forcing draw? Again, this is a four-game match. A draw with the black pieces is fine. I mean, you do want yep. the white pieces against Wesley So. That is your best chance to fight back and score a victory, even though you did lose with white in game one. Can Sam Sevian keep, keep fighting here? I don't think so. I think we're going to get a perpetual check and a very quick draw. Yeah. And, and we called it before this second set of games started. We said that if you're a player who lost the first the first game, it's kind of a stop the bleeding mentality. As exciting as it would be to win on command, I also don't judge mm -hmm. Sevian for this quick draw, given that he doesn't want it to get away from him against a player like Wesley So. So, unfortunately, we both foreshadowed what was the truth, which is that classical Nimzos are not the Berlin but they are lines that White can often safely choose and have some deep prep that forces a draw. From Wesley's perspective, he protects well his one-game lead. Well said. And here we have a Rui Lopez in Perugia versus Artemi of just a kind of extremely standard run-of-the-mill Rui Lopez position, which also can arise out of an Italian. I made this point earlier in um, Tata Steel commentary. We have this kind of weird convergence uh, because when people play the Rui Lopez now, they often play these sidelines with D3. And these sidelines with D3 often transition back into positions that you can get out of an Italian. So this is a fairly non-theoretical battle. And it's a typical Artemiev-type position. He likes these long, drawn-out maneuvering battles. He's really, really good in them. He's really good at them. Often he's... The faster player uh, uh, right now, Ferrugia doing a very good job maintaining a little bit of an advantage on the clock. So, uh, so we'll see if that pays off. But you're right. Now that we've checked in with this one and we see a little bit of a preview in terms of what the evaluation is in our other matchups, Sambel, Tursa Hakin, Teeny Edge against Jose Martinez, Mamedov and Nepo 50 50, Lazovic doing okay over there against Geary. Let's, let's actually go over to that game. Reminder, everybody, if you missed it, the biggest story of the day, Dennis Lazovic sending Hikaru Nakamura home in shocking fashion. Here he has 
a small edge against Anish Giri in our second set of matches. Yeah, and if you're Dennis Lazovic, you know, what should your strategy be against Anish Giri to try to score a second massive upset? I think you want to drag this, you want to make three draws, and you want everything to be decided in one game. I mean, this is the classic piece of advice that's given to sports teams. If you're the underdog, you want to shorten the game. If you're the underdog in a chess match, you want to shorten the match. So maybe make three safe draws, and in one particular game, absolutely anything can happen. So I think Dennis Lazovic doing the right thing by being ultra solid in these first two games. Maybe he had some winning chances in the last game, but you can't really fault him for wanting to play it safe with the black pieces. And here again, I think we're going to get a bunch of trades. It looks like the rest of the minor pieces, Danny, are very likely to disappear from the board. And then we're going to get some sort of drawn end game. Agreed. Although, as I thought through your strategy, completely agree with the sports analogy. If you are the underdog, you want to shorten the game. Let it all come down to two minutes in the fourth quarter, right? Your best chance. Exactly. But also, the other argument is that with every game Anish Giri plays, his bed head looks better. Right now, he's clearly a tired Anish playing in his first <laughs> matches of the 2024 Champions Chess Tour, Anish. But with every single move, Anish Giri is the stronger player and likely should be finding his form. I think Anish might have just heard me. So he fixes his hair and quickly, yeah. quickly ducks under the camera to hide in shame from his bed head. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty late over there in Europe, but no judgment. I'm, I'm the last person to judge someone for taking a <laughs> late afternoon nap. Um, but yeah, I mean, this position that he's currently has on the board, I, I mean, I would prefer white. I really like the, the knight on g4 and how it's pressuring the bishop on f6. You can't just play knight take c3 because white will take on f6 first and then recapture on c3 and black will have some problems uh, with his kingside pawn structure. Maybe you can do that. Maybe that is the fastest yeah. path to a draw. But you see queen c6 by Anish Giri. Okay, we are getting a bunch of trades here. Knight takes d5, queen takes d5. And actually, that particular endgame maybe is a little bit preferable for black. But I don't yeah. think Dennis will have any trouble holding this with six minutes on his clock. Yeah, we're going to see a draw in this game. Yeah, likely... Likely no fireworks coming, so we are going to quickly switch to one of the other matchups. Speaking of fireworks, the one that gave us the most the most of them was uh, Nepo versus Mamedov in the first game. If you missed it, it was it was quite the thriller. This one much more tame, but also pretty comfy for the uh, the former world championship challenger. That being Jan Nepomnesi. Uh not not yeah. not a bad position here as Black. Not a lot going on. Yeah, I mean, this is not what Ralph Mamedov wanted out of a Vienna, which is what he played, by the way. He played e4, e5, and then knight to c3, uh, clearly trying to avoid uh, Jan's preparation in the Petrov, which has just been his main weapon in the last couple of years. You would never think Jan Nepomnesi would become a Petrov expert, but that's exactly what's happened. And yeah. if anything, I think black is slightly better in this endgame. I mean, b4, I carve out the d4 square for your knight, Rook to a8, excellent move by Jan, getting control of the only open file. Uh, infiltrate to a2 with your rook. Okay, Ralph is trying to make something happen on the king side, but look at the way that Jan has set up his pawns. He's controlling the g5 square, so he is immobilizing yep. white's pawns on the king side, and on the queen side, black is making moves. The rook will come to the second rank, as you said. That's right. This rook, this rook on e4... Looks cute at first, right? But if he doesn't he doesn't fulfill some sort of aggressive destiny, that rook could be super awkwardly placed. We see that Nepo's rooks communicating well on the queen side. White's rooks feel a little bit confused as to what should happen next. In fact, on that note, the right way to maybe justify their position is to blow open the center, and here comes d4. He's doing what he has to do uh, to muddy the waters. The problem is that d4 does not really carry much of a threat. I mean, does he want yeah. to play d takes e5? Maybe, but it's not such a scary prospect for Jan. So maybe Jan can just continue uh, with his queenside program and go rook a2. He could consider yeah. uh, the more explosive move b4. But okay, this is a big decision here for Jan, and that is why he's taking a little bit more time. Rook to a4 is another move that you can consider if you are worried about d takes e5. And, and oh, guess nice what? Call. Rook a4 is on the board. 
Right on cue. Look at Danya. A little guess the move action. Um, by the way, anyone following can actually play guess the move if you're into that kind of thing. It's a fun little game we often don't talk a lot about. Um, shout out to Dragon B70. Guess the move legend on chess.com. <laughs> um, all right. Rook A4 pins the D4 pawn. Maybe even makes B4 more of a threat. Wow. Yeah, this... Knight F5. Kind of a weird position. Knight f5 has a second purpose, by the way. Defends the rook, so that d takes e5 or d5 are both a threat. Great call. And looks like, okay, Jan can drop his bishop back to f8. Again, if he wants to sort of keep the status quo. But h5, I was going to point this move out, just hitting where it hurts. Look at how Jan is using both sides of the board. Rook to a4 yeah. on the queen side. h5 on the opposite end of the board. And if Ralph plays the move f3... He continues to kind of weaken his second rank. And then the move rook yeah. to a2 would be a lot scarier because the prospect of rook takes c2 would cause white yeah. to have to double back and bring the knight back to e3. And you don't want to do any of that. I agree. And honestly, these types of positions are just right up Nepo's alley, especially in rapid. And and okay, we look like looks like Momedov is trying to force the issue, knight g3 made sure that, that we were going to get this capture. But I still, I like Nepo's chances. I also like his clock management. The distance between the two timers is only getting greater. And yeah. uh, it's a little early to say that, that that Jan would win his second game in a row, but it is trending a positive direction for Nepo. It most certainly is. I like how Ralph Mamedov is, is prosecuting the defensive task. He's trying to create counterplay against that G7 pawn. That's why he played H5, trying to fix that pawn on G7 and preparing to jump back into F5 when the moment is right. But there's no question Jan is in the driver's seat here. He's got that two-minute time advantage again. Jan seems to yeah. be in very good form. It's too early to tell. We don't have a lot to go off of. But I like what Jan is showing, the kind of chess and the kind of game control that, that Jan is showing so far in this mini-match. I completely agree. And he seems poised for success. He's focused. Wearing that chess.com hoodie, it looks good on him. I'm not going to lie. I, don't, I think we sent him that hoodie a while ago in a gift package, so it's nice to see that that swag didn't go to waste. Um, Great. All right. Do you want a hoodie, too? Is that what you're saying? You want me to send you one? I, no, I would never ask no 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 i mean no. not that i would complain i i definitely it would it would enter my regular rota wardrobe rotation okay. i actually really like hoodies big fan hoodies are hoodies are great all right hoodies are um, i always confuse the sweatshirt and sweater terminology my wife yells mm -hmm. at me I, about it so i just go with hoodie um but all right we've got some other games to check in with vladimir <clears throat> sorry vladislav artemyev and Ali Reza Ferruja, they drew their first game. Ferruja with a teeny edge here. We also haven't checked in at all with the second game between Sambel Tursahakian. This one's spicy. And Jospin. Ooh, there's a... J -j 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 is that a J -j 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 three? Are you just happy to see me? Look, at I'm going to do it. I'm going to put my pony on it. I vote you definitely put a pony on F3. Now, he's kind of keeping this move in his pocket <clears throat> right now is Jose. And I think he's trying to combine his kingside play with long-term pressure against white's c4 pawn. So we might see him actually doubling rooks on the c yeah. file and trying to create another source of pressure. By the way, rook bc8, the benefit of that move is that it does threaten maybe b5 in some situations. First, he puts his pony on f3. I mean, who could resist? Who could resist a check on f3? Maybe g5 is another move to consider to try to restrict... Oh. White's knight. Uh -huh. Now, of course, Danny, White's knight could drop back to E1 and trade the knights off. So I don't think that Se that Teresa Hakin is in huge trouble here, but I think he needs to tread very, very carefully to keep the balance. Yeah. Robert Hess loses his mind anytime a pawn is yes. three squares away dominating That's a knight, so right? True. Robert Hess, an angel gets his wings every time we see that affair, but... I agree with you. G5 might be a little rushed because 91, you've actually taken away the escape square of your own pony. So perhaps now we see your move, Rook B to C8. And I like what you said. Okay, Queen of Five. I liked Rook B to C8 because I thought it would threaten Queen E6, which would be some sort of oh, double attack. But instead, Josh cool. is just being, he's being a little more direct, just going after H3, which... Maybe there's just a forcing problem here. Now he plays Rook C8, and is G5 a stronger threat? 
Well, also, we should keep in mind the knight from f4 can jump into d5 and threaten a family fork on e7. You don't get oh. to fork all four of the most important pieces often. Of course, Jose would prevent uh, that fork in one of many ways. I mean, king f8, uh, he could yeah. shift one of his uh, his rook from c8 to e8. So we see king g2 by Sam Belter Sahakin, and I like the trend of the game um, for white. He's fixed the immediate problems with his king safety. The knight on f3, yes, it looks very pretty, but its counterpart on f4 might actually be yeah. the stronger piece with the stronger potential of migrating over to d5 and also potentially attacking the b6 pawn by shifting one of the rooks to the b file later in the game. That's, that's a really fair point. You didn't mention one idea. If the knight goes to d5, we should always True. consider an idea of queen takes followed by capturing here. Not that it's not that it's something you should do unnecessarily, but when you have a rook and knight working together with a mating net around the king, let's just let's just keep an eye on that that type of tactic. Uh, but you're right. I mean, we talked a lot about the pressure for Jospam, a little bias, but the more you look at the position, weakness, weakness, weakness. This knight might find the d5 square. So yeah, you have to be careful if game. you're black. Yeah. It's absolutely anybody's game. I like Jose from the clock perspective. He's up a minute on the clock. He's got probably more meat on the bone when it comes to kingside attacking chances, but it's anybody's yeah. game. I was also wondering if we could quickly check back into the Lazavik Geary game because I'm surprised that yeah. it still hasn't ended yet. Okay, never mind. It is about to end. It's and we will get a draw. I, I, I was keeping an eye on it, which is why I didn't go to it, <laughs> yeah, but you, you hey. forced my hand. We'll just let everybody sorry, know sorry. that we're likely to get our, our second peaceful result in this match. It's okay. No, it was great. Uh, so we checked in with that one. Again, there also hasn't been... Well, there's been some changes in this look Feruja at the clock Artemyev. It's like an yeah. opening, but the players already have like a minute 20 for Vladislav yeah. <laughs> and two minutes 20 for Ali Reza, and the center is opening up. Look at the tactics from Artemyev. Knight takes d5. Yeah. Wow. Bishop takes d5. The rook takes c1. The bishop is hitting the knight here. The rooks will be traded. And it... Wait. That book. That stutter because i don't know what's going to happen <laughs> you actually you actually cannot play bishop takes d5 because the irony yeah, because is that white actually loses a piece at the end of the line yep no and let's show <laughs> it hilarious. which is why i started stuttering instead of recommending a line because bishop takes d5 is one of those moves that backfires we trade you take and we gain a tempo on the queen before gobbling up that pony who put itself on the rim of the board so that's exactly why we have Faruja thinking what other moves are possible. Does knight he just F5. need to put the knight on f5? Yeah, okay. This, he's is, this is probably it. what we'll. Oh, he's played it. There we go. And knight takes e3. We are. We're getting action here. As you said, this is kind of an opening in a bullet game. I mean, move 23, they're basically playing bullet chess now. I love Artemius' position, his bishop on b7, right? Don't sleep on that bishop. He's got this idea of swinging his rook from c6 over to g6, and his queen from d8 can come into the action with queen to g5. If Ali Reza well, takes on e7, that queen can go one of a million different directions, Danny, as you're pointing out. Now Ali Reza is now down on the clock. He's in some trouble here. Yes, this is what's happening. Yeah, you're three, right. Queen, G, Queen G5. G5. Okay. Queen G5 is also really irritating because it's a skewer to the rooks, so you can't exactly. meet Queen G5 with the obvious rook G3. Uh-oh. Queen way, G5 is a very nasty move. Here, Queen G5, that actually is really irritating because you try to... Okay, I got to show it. We're back to the analysis board. If you play a natural move with the rook, I, I want to just sacrifice the queen on G2, but I can't, so instead I'll sacrifice the rook and threaten oh. checkmate here. And note that something like rook g3 doesn't work because of queen to d2. Oh, that's so important. And that is why in the current game position, I think queen g5 has been played. Ali Reza finds the correct move, rook f1. Because wow. here, after rook takes c4, rook g3, in the line that you just showed, you can't move the queen away with tempo. What yep. presence of mind to spot this in two seconds as Ali Reza Faruja did. Now the sacrifice on g2... And rook g6 check <laughs> is probably a dead end One. because white can always cover the discover check with yeah. his bishop from d5. Um, it's very tempting, but you have to avoid these speculative options. Yeah, rook g2. It kind of gives you a rush to play all of these moves, but then you resign yeah. after bishop d5. Okay, so he's yeah. made a move. He's got 25 seconds on the clock. And he's played rook to g6, rook g6. threatening checkmate. 
Okay, but, but Rook it, G3. it seems that despite the fireworks, we might be seeing a, a pair of rooks followed by a pair of bishops and ultimately heading toward a little bit of a tame end game. Although even that, we shouldn't dismiss the potential for a decisive result. I like this move bishop to d5 first. He's kind of saying, look, if you take, yeah, those pawns are doubled, but my king will have a perfectly safe little cocoon to hide itself in and eventually become a beautiful butterfly. Great point. And the a5 pawn is a long-term weakness in the event of the trade, which has just happened seven seconds now for Vladislav Artemiev. Suddenly, he's the one who has to keep his position together. How is he going to defend yeah. the a5 pawn? And now the e5 pawn is also hanging. Maybe queen to d4 can be tried. Uh... But now takes, takes, and rook f5 still. Yeah. Still some defensive effort I... required. I think it is a draw. But let's see if Vladislav Artemiev has what it takes. He's not warmed up. This could backfire. And the Nepo it's, game it's, ends in a draw, by the way. Yeah, Nepo has ended in a draw. Anish Kiri Lazovic has ended in a draw. If you're just tuning in, we already had a very early draw between Wesley So and Sam Sebian. We will update you about each of those matches, respectively, in a minute. But okay, Ferruja, the first to win a pawn, he's going into a rook ending with an extra Peshka. Mm. Likely should be a draw with best play, but Artemiev with only five seconds. Yeah, and I mean, this is not the worst version to have if you're Ali Reza Ferruja, he's going to be playing G4. One second yeah. for Vladislav and H5. Very important move. Very nice. Oh, the presence of mind to throw this move in with one second on the clock. G4 played anyway. But every pawn trade is helping yep. Black. Yeah, this should be a pretty makeable draw. Pretty every makeable pawn draw. trade helps the defender. We're going to get a trade of the D for the B pawn. This single outside A pawn, likely not enough. And uh, after rook to b4, simplification that we called for. This rook is ideally placed behind the pass pawn and also cutting off the king's aggressive action. So so good stuff. Good defense from Artemia. We've seen this before. Rook g4 can be tried. f6, h4. But black steps away. One second. Oh, my God. Barely got that move off. King h7. And, okay, this is a two-on-one, wow. Danny. Ali Rez is going to torture him. I actually don't know why Artemiev didn't play f6 there and defend the pawn, but this is still very drawable. This is pretty easy. You just shuffle your pieces back and forth. Just don't yeah. blunder your rook. Do not blunder <laughs> your rook. Do not pre-move. Do not pass go and collect $200. Appreciate the pro tip. Don't blunder the rook. Got it. Yeah, Got that's it. all you have to do. <laughs> oh, and Samuel Tersahakin blundered a, a, a queen fork. He blundered his Wait, queen, what? and he's going to lose. Oh, my gosh. He, is, he has lost. We, I I forgot that matchup was still going. I guess I we're going to let this. Well, okay. We'll go see what the final moments of that one were in just a second. We're not going to leave the only game in progress. Uh, but, yeah, Sambel Tersahakin blunders his queen against Jasmine in one move. Ouch. That's just what Jose does to you. I mean, the guy is in such good form. He puts a lot of pressure on the board, on the clock. Sam Bell with a big blow. We'll cover that game momentarily. But Ali Reza, he's still trying. And yeah. this is a big moment. Where do you go with the king if you're black? H5 can be tried. F5 maybe. Mm. It's still a draw, but it's getting a little dicey. What We've do you do now? These... Yeah, this is going to get weird. King G2, rook F4, king G3. Rook F1, still a draw. King G7. Yeah, holding everything. Whew. Still They make it look some easy with no do. time on the clock. Dude, imagine if you're sitting there and you're Vladislav Artemiev playing this against Feruja. I Like you said, Danny, they make it look so easy, but trust me, it's, it's not. It's actually really yeah. hard to hold these positions. Ali Reza knows every little trick to make you yep. work for it. Yeah, and uh, the presence of mind by Artemiev to know exactly when to bring the rook behind the pawns only after White had played h5. This is really stellar technique. Not that anyone here is probably here for this level of rook ending education, but if you are, check out the defense by Artemiev in this one later. This was really accurate stuff, and the eval bar reveals it. There's just been no blunders, just perfect chess from Black. We might get a three-time repetition here, actually, because this type of position has already been reached. Rook G1, Rook yeah. F1. And Black's Rook basically has just enough squares along the yep. F file. You have Rook F4. And if the White King moves to G3, you check the King from G1 and go back to F4 or F1. 
Okay, rook takes f6 and g5 is futile huh. because white is left with an h pawn. It is a cool trick to be aware of, but it doesn't work in this type of position. Okay, that's it. I think we're going to get a draw momentarily here. Yeah, the moment the king goes to g3, the rook goes back to f1. I think we already saw that position twice. I think Ferruja knows that, which is why he played this awkward rook f7 move. But still, there's uh, not a lot going to happen here. King h6 back. I mean, he's just going to keep his rook on f3 as long as possible. Yeah, this is this is easy. Rook f1 and a draw by repetition. Just like that. Okay, we quickly go over to the Sunville Tursa Hockey game oh, just to see that it was it was equal. Oh, it was equal. No. It was, we're doing our, our own little game review. Hit the game review button, everybody. And you might see that you lost just because of one move. <laughs> Queen to F3. Well, he Ouch. was down a pawn. At this point, it was already kind of bad. But actually, okay. Jose was the one. Jose was the one down to five seconds to Sunville's yeah. 12. But what a blunder. Yeah. I mean, this is a very drawable position, Danny. He should have held this yep. with proper defense. But it's fair. Jospom's up a pawn. There's a threat of queen g3. We should give credit where credit's due. Yes, it was a blunder. But obviously, yeah. the pressure brought by Jose Martinez is something he did a lot yesterday, which is why he was our top finisher in the play in Swiss. The pressure here once again pays off. He gets his first dub in his match. And, uh, and takes that one and a half to half lead. So, all right, let's bring up the scoreboard and show everybody where we sit. The action is fast. It is furious. We love you, Vin Diesel. I think we do. We'll talk about that later. Danya, your thoughts? What a, a round. I mean, this is a very fascinating four-game mini-match. There's a lot of match strategy involved. We saw Sam Sevian not minding a draw. I think that's good. I, that's what you have to do. But he will have to strike with the white pieces. Yana Pomnishi, he takes care of business. Puts, him, puts himself one step closer to taking his match. And Geary versus Lazovic, two draws. Danny, that is going to be a fascinating final two games. Dennis, what a Cinderella run. And it continues. He's doing great against Anish Geary thus far. Yeah, Dennis Lazovic sent Hikaru Nakamura home for those just joining. And if Danya's strategy is the correct one, then Dennis Lazovic is on track. He says, look, if you're the underdog, keep it close. Let it all come down to one game. Dennis Lazovic is trying to drag Anish Giri deep into the dark woods, and hopefully it comes down to a coin flip. So, all right, that <laughs> one's locked up. You already gave us a quick rundown there. I think Wesley So, of course, as you said, with a with a lead over Sam Sevian. This might be Sam Sevian's last chance going into this next game where he has the white pieces. But, okay, before we continue our action here, discovering who will get their Division I hopes, uh, who will keep their Division I hopes alive, we're joined once again by Tanya Sajdev. Tanya has been keeping an eye on all the other action that we can't possibly follow in Divisions two and three. Tanya, how are you and uh, what do you got for us? I'm all over the place because while I'm keeping my eye out on all the other divisions, I can't keep my eyes off what's happening in Division 1 drama. That was great technique by Artemiev. Danis Lazovic doing amazing things, holding Anish Giri to two draws. Uh, we saw that Rook Pawn ending at the end with Artemiev, so I thought I'd bring up the antidote to that and show a real classic attacking match that we had in Division 3. I'm going to rewind, go back in time, because, Danny, some games are just so beautiful that they're timeless. And this is from the match, uh, Daniel Dubov, OS's uh, Mian Le. Five decisive games, all won by white. And this oh, is wow. from game two. Uh, Daniel Dubov with the white pieces. He lost game one, so he's got to make his comeback in this. And it started slow. In the opening, we had a Fian Kata opening. I'm going to go through the opening really quick uh, and get to the fun stuff. So we saw Black take control of the center early on. And uh, Dubov pushes on the queen side. If given a free hand, he's going to go marching down the board, target the base of the pawn chain. He stopped immediately with the move A5. And the pieces continue to come out. As Black finishes development, Dubov strikes in the center, challenges Black's advanced pawns in the center. This is all pretty standard. After the trades, we see the bishop come out. The bishop goes back. Some more trades to follow. And so far, so good. Both players um, playing um, playing good chess, taking out pieces. And this is when things start to get spicy. Not Sriracha level just yet, Dania, but we are getting there. Black decides to make the move <laughs> E5. 
four opening up the center opening up the queen you can take this pawn with either the pawn or the rook black will recapture the pawn on b2 destroy white pawn structure for daniel dubov it's not enough that you can capture with two pieces he decides he wants another piece there which is the knight the knight falls back to d2 dubov has never cared about the pawns he wants active pieces he wants that knight on e4 black snaps up the pawn on d3 the knight jumps in attacks the queen dubov has given up two pawns picks up one of them in return for the pawn sacrifice and look at that piece activity meanwhile black still lacking development jumps in with the knight a really nice move follows up queen to d6 not giving black the time to take out the bishop to e6 excuse my arrows <laughs> but if you do play bishop to e6 white will target the queen and there's no way that the queen can remain connected to the knight on e5 so do are really making sure that mianle cannot develop the bishop and the queen side pieces the queen is hit comes back once again it's all about tempo when you're on the attack and the initiative a queen trade daniel dubov knows nothing about queen trades he's going for the king the queen slides into h5 also notice how most of black's pieces are on the queen side so black's king is feeling a little bit in the danger zone things start to get exciting really soon but the precision by dubov here the way he executed the attack from this moment on is super instructive he first hits the queen on b4 making it go to a square that's not ideal you really want to fall back on e7 get it closer to your own king but if you do that you fall in the line of the white's rook moves like knight d2 maybe there's something better but i think the knight just comes back and you've got attack oh, on c4 knight d2 is amazing ended. tanya knight d2 it, wow that wins a knight <laughs> it would win the knight on the spot instead of uh, walking into that he goes back to b6 and now Dubov is setting up his final blow with starting with a retreating move with the bishop to f1 because this knight from c4 is the one piece that can get fastest to the king's defense from e5. He first attacks it, black defends it, Dubov trades it. And Dania, you're gonna love what happened next. White just decides to give up pieces to get to Black's king in true Daniel Dubov style and boom, wow. knight to f6 check forcing the black pawn on g7 to grab the knight Damn, says, girl. take my knight <laughs> give me your king jumps up with the rook to e4 do you even rook lift do bob apparently does we've seen all those videos of him working out and don't forget that move bishop to f1 which got rid of that knight to e5 so there's no more defense here the rook comes into the attack the bishop attacks the rook gives a check if you move the king Rook h4 wins the game on the spot. The bishop falls back. Dubov doesn't care. Picks up the pawn. The rook and the queen are lining up. The mate is incoming. Sure, take my rook. Give oh my me your gosh. king. Double exclamation mark. Daniel Dubov is going all out for Black's king, which cannot be defended. Gives a check. The final few moves. The final desperate attempts. It doesn't matter. There's a mate in one, which needs to be defended. The queen defends it. The rook comes back. Final check. And after f3, there's nothing to be done. Sure, you can go queen a2, king h3 would follow. The king would eventually hide, and you cannot stop the mate on the h5. Dubov sacrifices a knight, sacrifices a rook, and wins the game in classic Dubov style. Went on to win the match and eliminated Mian Le. That's a master class <laughs> by Dubov, master class by you, Chanya. That was fascinating. I feel like, I feel like Dubov plays the moves that I dream about, and he somehow makes them work. I can never make it work. Yeah, if I would give up the knight and a rook, I'd probably just lose after two moves, even if I thought it was a great <laughs> attack. But he just started with such style and finished it off. His execution in this game was so on point. And Daniel, uh, I know that you really enjoy these kind of attacks. Knight f6 would be a bullet move for you as well. <laughs> Yeah, except it would be unsound, but in Dubov's case, it is perfectly <laughs> sound. Great explanation, Tanya. That was riveting. And Daniel Dubov, I mean, no matter what division he's in, he's just everyone's favorite player. He's so fun to watch. And we should remind everybody, no matter what division they're in now, you win Division 3, you're guaranteed at least Division 2. You win Division 2, you get automatic placement Division 1. So these games are not just for the educational and awesome analysis by Tanya. So, all right. Stick with us. Of course, we have plenty of chess ahead. And as we throw to a break, we know that a lot of our viewers are watching because they want to get better. They want to become chess masters, but they might find that it's harder to become a chess master than they first thought when they started falling in love with the game of Kings. But maybe it's your setup. So uh, check, check out the info we've got for you at the break.
This is John. John loves to study chess. This is David. David loves to study chess as well, but efficiently. John spends more time setting up the board and figuring out what's on the page of his book than he gets to study. David likes to take it easy and use his time wisely. David has finished his exercise for today. John should try the same. Welcome to a world where each game writes a new story with endless possibilities and surprising twists. We present the next big new tournament, the Freestyle Chess Goat Challenge. At the forefront of this epic chess spectacle is none other than Magnus Carlsen, the former world champion, facing his first duel with the reigning world champion Ding Liren since his title victory. In addition to this top duel, Carlsen has selected six other top challengers to make the tournament especially exciting. Be sure to watch all the games on the live stream at chess.com and on our freestyle-chess.com website from February 9th to 16th, 2024 at the first Freestyle Chess Goat Challenge at the luxurious Weissenhaus Resort. Experience the thrill and fascination of chess in a completely new light. The year-long Champions Chess Tour consists of four main online events and one live final. Each event will begin with a play-in tournament. 69 players from the play-in. 69? Really? Nice. You had to choose that number, Michael? Will be joined on the second day by the four qualifiers from the previous tour event. D Michael, does that even work? How do we have 73 players competing in knockout chess? All right. Okay. In each event, players also accrue points for the season-long leaderboard. The final standings will decide who joins. So we have a Swiss match play, double elimination knockout, and a leaderboard being, being tracked throughout to ultimately determine players for the live final. That's right. Okay, that's... Honestly, if you're a little confused, that's okay. But the math checks out. You can trust us. The works okay watch all the action as the best chess players in the world compete to be crowned it's not 73 players in divisional play it's only 56 players in division play it's 73 in division placement coming out of the swiss plus the four people division plays is 8 plus 16 plus 32 yeah i'm just saying we gotta restart the video the next cct champion jesus <laughs> what are we doing here Love that video. I love that video. I love Meetup. Use Meetup. Find other local chess players in your area. We love them, appreciate their sponsorship and support. We continue on. It's time for the third round, Janya, in the 2024 Champions Chess Tour inaugural event. That is the Chessable Masters. That is where you are if you are somehow lost on the internet. Danya, 
we could jump in and go a lot of different places to kick things off. I, I'm going to I'm gonna choose our adventure real quick and just go to Anish Giri, Dennis Lazovic. I, I'm, just, I I'm, really, I'm doing that. I really love this match. I really, really like yeah. this match. I want to see how far Dennis Lazovic goes. And this is a pivotal game, Danny, because if you're Anish Giri, you don't want to rely on defeating Dennis Lazovic with the black pieces in the last game. And you certainly don't want this to get into Armageddon because we know that absolutely anything can happen. You want to yeah. decrease the chances that something crazy happens. So for Anish Giri, who plays the same opening that Wei Yi played in the last round of Tata Steel to defeat Vidit, but Dennis Lazovic chooses a slightly different counter setup. We have a completely symmetrical Kali system, also known as the Zucker Tort uh, setup, at, at least the way it was taught to me. Yeah. Hey, that's the thing about chess openings is there's lots of different names. You know, who claimed it first, I guess. But we can see based on our eval bar, right as I say it, opening theory ends. We were still following roads that have been traveled many times before. Oh, yeah. I would argue even here, even if the opening book no longer has enough depth to not just switch to a traditional engine eval. <laughs> this is a position we've seen a lot of times out of these structures. White puts the knight on e5. You're kind of you're kind of hoping for an exchange and then maybe a quick assault of the king side, whether it's F or knight enters. You're, you're trying to get some kind of attack going here. The Kali system is like the less cool, more old school, younger brother of the London system. Now, it's like everybody's ordering off Amazon, but there was a time when Kmart uh, was like the leader in the field. There was a time when Sears uh, sent out a catalog and that's how you got what you wanted. So the Kali system had its moment in the sun. <laughs> It's gotten less popular, but it's still a very good opening. It's a very solid opening. It's a good way to avoid the by now well-trodden paths of the London system. But I also like the way that Dennis Lazovic is responding to it. He's basically copying all of Anisha's moves. And Anisha's moves are usually pretty good, so they deserve to be copied. Whoever had Danya makes a comparison from the Kali Zukator to Kmart on their bingo, <laughs> you win. I obviously had to turn and type that up. Can we clip and shift that moment? When was the last time we compared any opening to Kmart? Zukator to Kmart? You're <laughs> even old enough to pretend that you remember Kmart. You know, I remember getting excited when my mom took me to Kmart. All right. There is still a Kmart, actually, that's open. I think the only Kmart that's still open is in North Carolina, but I'm actually um, not totally not sure. <laughs> no, permanently closed. The Kmart in Charlotte's permanently closed. I was going to say, it's almost like the vintage Blockbuster, the guy who owns the only Blockbuster oh, yeah, left the in only the world, one. right? <laughs> I think yeah. that's in Bend, Oregon. Shout out. Shout out to you. You know, this bud, this bud's for you. Um, but uh, yeah, this is, this is crazy. Um, we have an opening that now White gets a little bit a little bit more than black. The doubled E-pawns. Going to be helpful for Geary if he can open this diagonal and get the D-file to go with it. There's always some tactics to keep in mind. But but this isn't the spiciest position. No. It's a pretty stable position. Anish Geary is relying on the power of his dark scored bishop. Um, there will be stuff happening on the D-file. I think the D-file is going to be a major conduit. Uh, through which a lot of the action happens. White's going to bring a rook to d1. Black is likely to shift the queen away from d7 because the queen is going to be very vulnerable after a white rook comes on d1. So I think that Anish got exactly what he wanted. He's slightly better, maybe only very slightly, but he has a relatively risk-free position where he understands the plans and the subsequent moves are pretty easy to make. Agreed. And uh, it, despite it being a little tame, it can get away from black if you're not careful. So Dennis takes his time before playing the move bishop f6, which pins the d-pawn to the bishop on b2. All right, I like okay. it. We'll come back to it in just a moment. A lot of other options going on here. Uh, reminder that this one is completely deadlocked, but a match that has a favorite so far is Jan Napomnishi versus Ralph Mamedov. Jan won the first game. And right now he's uh, kind of, it's funny. We got the same peace conglomerate that we have in the game between Lazovic and Geary, but a different pawn structure in yeah. the center. And I feel like, I, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I feel like Jan and Ralph are essentially following one of their games from the 2023 World Cup. Their head-to-head -head match, that one of the games featured this exact pawn structure. And that's why I think Ralph has been playing so quickly. 
it looks like a pretty pleasant position for Black. He's got this pawn on d4. And that pawn on d4, Danny, is a very powerful pawn because it is completely clamping down. It is paralyzing. It's vis-a-vis -vis on c2, as you're indicating. I think Ralph is better, and he needs to capitalize on this opportunity. He's up on the clock for the first time in this match. And how does he increase the pressure on c2? Does he play a5 and chase the queen away? Does he play bishop e5 and try to get the dark squared bishops off the board? I don't know. No, but you're right. He is in control, though. So he's he's going to take his time choosing it. He's earned that time advantage on the clock, almost three minutes. Although now now down to about two. So, yeah, a5 and b4. Oh, wow, a move we G5. didn't even talk about. G5. Damn, girl. The, the rook defends it. G5 and we live. Where are you, Canny? We in here. We love you, James Canny. But G5 hits the bishop. Wait a second. Wait a second. Where if does that, it go? If Wait, if it goes, are we losing the pawn? We, it's happening. It's happening. It's Here happening. we go. And the eval bar can't decide, do I want to take this pawn? Do I not? Because after the rooks are traded on C2, the problem is that the D3 pawn is hanging. There's a check on D1 that could potentially yeah. be devastating. I'm actually surprised that the eval bar isn't more drastically yeah. in, in Black's favor White has to be very and, careful, and he's given up another pawn on a2. This is cu coming off for Yana Pomnishi. The wheels are coming off. Let's let's analyze it real quick just to understand, because that's one of those moments where the engine probably has something to teach us. What was it? Apparently, White needed oh to my take God. and then find rook takes e6. What oh, in the on. world? And then and I guess queen works. takes d6. And, <laughs> and then queen takes d6, what giving up everything for e6. And even on queen d1 check, white has bishop f1, and it's actually a complete mess because e6 and g5 are hanging. No oh. surprise, Jan de Pomnishi doesn't find this. But it's one of those issues where the eval bar was so deceptive. It was making it seem like the position was balanced, but only if you find this? Are you effing kidding me? Instead, it's rook e1, and all of a sudden, Mamedov grabs a2, and he's in complete control. We're going to see a deadlock match after this. Let's go. Unbelievable. And here's another problem for white. If you grab the pawn on g5, um, the yeah. problem is not that black plays a5. A5 looks like it traps the queen, but it actually doesn't because the b5 pawn is going to hang. The actual yeah. problem is that black is going to stick a queen on c3. If bishop takes g5 happens right now, black will yeah. trade on e2 and stick a queen on c3. And Danny, white's position, it just turns into dust. Everything is yeah. collapsing. The d3 pawn is weak. The queen trade is out of the question. You're screwed if you're on a pawn issue. I don't see a way to prolong this game, much less to get back into this game. And again, just like we called out game one where Yonda Pomnishi won, that the clock was revealing in terms of how comfortable the players were. In this situation, Ralph Mamedov is very comfortable that Nepo decided to repeat their battle from the event you mentioned. And now, yes. now Mamedov is like, well, I'm, Thank uh, you. I'm happy with this <laughs> position. He's completely winning. I mean, Jan, with the white pieces, I praised his form. And it's like every time I do that, I did that in Tata Steel, he lost to Wei Yi. I do that here, he gets demolished out of the opening. Queen to c3. Ralph Omedov has to find the move queen to c3. Otherwise, he's much better. But the only move which maintains a clearly winning position is queen to c3. Yeah. It's it's always fun when the best engine move in a knockout is a subtle offering of the Queen Exchange and Bang. Ralph Momentum finds it. What a nice move. Of course, Jan didn't want to trade and allow the C pawn to rush, but as you already pointed out, the B3 pawn is gonna fall. The D3 pawn is also weak, by the way. This is this is fantastic position hmm. for black. But actually, I mean, if you play Queen takes D3 here, the engine is giving Queen takes B3, which is a, a viable move, but Queen takes D3 is a more natural capture in my mind because it creates a pass pawn on d4. Maybe Jan is setting up that exchange sacrifice on e6 followed by queen takes d6. Maybe that is Jan's only path to complicating this game. So Ralph Mamedov doing a great job just pausing and saying, wait a second, I know how tricky Jan Nepomnishi is. Let's eliminate any unnecessary counterplay and any unnecessary adventures in this position. Yeah. Well, as we can see from the other games, most of them are pretty deadlocked. So I think we'll stay right here. We'll take 30 seconds to take a closer look at these players and their setup. Again, Jan having his first 
bad game maybe of of this match, but uh, he still looks pretty good in that chess.com swag. And by the way, you see that <laughs> as I haven't been able to figure out what's on the wall behind Yon to the left. I don't know if it's a samurai sword or something. Have you been able to see? Yeah, it's some sort of contraption that features a sword. I think that's the thing that's sticking down <laughs> into the floor in the direction of the floor, I suppose. I mean, I hope he doesn't have to use it on a daily basis because I, I yeah. definitely stay away from Yon Pomishi as it is due to his strength on the board. But, I mean, if he's going to use that sword, then I'm staying away from him off the board as well. Well, I'm definitely staying Peter, away from Peter him Lako, if he loses this game. <laughs> P Peter Lako's commentary. Obviously, people, people often spot the sword behind him. In this case, we've got a sword there for Yon. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, uh, this is a big moment. Mamedov kind of feels it, even if he hasn't calculated it fully yet. Queen takes b3 or queen takes d3. Just a reminder, queen takes d3. There's this sacrifice on e6, and things are going to get wild. And it all works, by the way, because bishops move backwards. There is no rook coming to c1. Make sure you, you keep that in mind. So, all right. We haven't checked on any other games really this round besides the one we started with. That was Lazovic Giri. It is headed toward another draw. I'm just going to quickly flash it. Wow. Looks like Dennis's, Dennis's plans to be a menace continue here. Uh, I... I guess I'll go to Ferruja Artemia. That one's opening up a little bit, unless you have another one you want to you want to hop into. No, this is good. And I just want to shout out Dennis Lazovic, kind of drawing from a position of strength. He was up a pawn in that position, and Geary had to win that pawn back. So, yeah, I mean, really impressive stuff. Dennis going down the pre-match plan that I outlined. You want to make three draws. You have the white pieces in the final game. I mean, you've got a great shot of upsetting Anish Geary. That will get, be a game to watch. Okay, speaking of games to watch, we're getting a bunch of trades. And are we going to get another quick draw in this game? And will that be three draws in this match? It will be as well. It'll be it the third be. draw. Uh -huh. They're currently dead. Like, why? Why couldn't the bishop take e1? I'm sorry. I got I to gotta get this out of my, out of my chess player I brain. Guess I'm backing up to seven? analysis. I'm actually I, I, not I totally thought... sure. No, it. Oh, okay. I was looking at this and saw queen takes first. No, but then if bishop c5, you have this. What? What? Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> oh. What, what a move. That's amazing. <laughs> King takes f2, queen h4 check. Now, that is not a desperado that you see every day, Danny. Wow. But, and now you're it, able to move your it, rook away. Oh. And black is up the exchange. Wow. Great find. Wait, so what? So what was the move then? If bishop Knight takes c1. E knight c7, knight not knight e7. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. But Okay, and it's complicated. But, it's not like white is winning, but white yeah, has to give the exchange you know, back. It's like it's like when you're reading the chess informant and they just give the evaluation interesting at the end of the line. You're like, someone got a little yeah. tired and lazy because this is exactly this is not, this is not a position where you can just end your analysis. Either way, we didn't get that line. My brain feels better if possible, and we move on to the live position. Okay, so a lot of trades on the horizon here. Black can sack the queen uh, on c4. Queen takes c4 is... Uh, I'm actually predicting queen takes c4, rook takes c4, bishop takes c4, bishop d2, rook d8. We might get like a complete fizzle out here if black takes on c4, which I yeah. think is going to happen. Queen takes c4, a massive exchange. By the way, you talked about Lazovic's plan to just get this thing down to one game. It's continuing to work. We have officially seen a draw in the game between Lazovic and Geary, their third draw in a row. Great stuff for Dennis. It, honestly, having the day of his life right now. And Ali Reza Faruja, big moment here. Queen takes c4 is going to lead to a mass liquidation because white is going to give the queen back up. I mean, we could show this line, but... I think we might see this line on the board. Um, so either way, this one is most likely to end in peace. Okay. Then maybe we'll let the game continue in peace and go over to Sam Sevian's last okay. chance with White. Remember, he's down a game. He lost the first game in this match with White. Wesley So doing, doing what he likes to do, which is win rapid chess games. Probably... Winning more rapid chess games than anyone on the planet, not named Magnus Carlsen these days. Uh, and I, I, again, I like his position as black. He's just been untouchable. Just 
And his position, again, so solid, no weaknesses. If anything, Black is probably in the driver's seat here. I agree. I agree. Black is in the driver's seat. E6, kind of a pretend weakness, but White lacks the firepower to really take advantage of it. And just don't don't sleep on my ability to grab this pawn. When I say my, I mean Wesley So, the royal we. <laughs> The Royal Wii, Danny Wrench doing business yeah. as Wesley So. It's like when you buy a ticket, and it's like, I wanted to fly Delta Airlines, not, you know, Zebra Air doing business as Delta Airlines. Like, <laughs> Danny Wrench doing business as Wesley will grab the pawn on A4. Right now, of course, the knight on D6 is in White's line of fire. I think the other big question is, does Wesley actively try to prepare E5? Or does he yeah. basically adopt a waiting strategy? Does he play bishop takes d3, rook takes d3, move the knight away from d6, knight back to f7, comes to mind, knight to c4, excellent move. And I think Wesley's going for the bailout here, which is big trouble for Sam Sebian. I mean, to win with black yeah. on demand against Wesley. So he's the worst guy uh, to have to win on demand against, especially with black. I'm still reeling from the comparison of Danny Wrench to Zebra Airlines. Like, just absolutely <laughs> hey, it's a compliment. amazing mature I love from Zebra Airlines. on the bingo card. This is why we need to get prop bets going in chess. Prop bets based <laughs> on the moves played. Prop bets based on what the commentators will actually say. Okay, Wesley not making it so simple decides instead of trading on D2 into the major piece endgame, he's ready to rock. By the way, what... If, if takes are you what piece are you taking back with? Okay, he answers the knight. I was gonna say you had you had every option, I think, almost to take back with whatever piece you wanted. Gains a tempo. Knight g6, knight c6, knight d3, another fancy liquidation. What a move by Wesley. Okay. And that leads to a bunch of trades. Wesley is so sharp today. I mean, you could just yeah. feel it in his play. He's not missing yep. a single detail. He's completely in control of these games. And this one is Heading in the direction of a draw. I mean, rook takes e7, queen takes e7. Sam could also give a check on b8 with his queen. But I would not keep the rooks on the board here because that could only backfire in white's direction. By the way, how is that Mamed up game going? Yeah, completely agree. Again, this is why Wesley So was not chosen by anybody. Similar to the first round of play, if you're just joining us, remember the higher seeds get to choose their opponents, but Wesley So is playing Sam because all the other opponents were chosen and Sam was stuck with, uh, you know, objectively, may maybe maybe uh, the best rapid player, second best. Again, you can't say that with Magnus Carlsen, but uh, he's... He's so tough. That's why Wesley's doing well. Momentov has been tough in this game. Looks like he's going to even up this match versus Nepo. Look at this position. Two pass pawns. One of them will become a new lady. And we're down to the final game. Uh, On-demand victory with black pieces against Nepo. Just another day in the life of Ralph Momentov. Like I said, he yeah. is just such a nasty opponent. He never goes away. He's super experienced. And he's got this incredibly sharp style that... Yeah, when it backfires, it can look ugly, but when it works, it looks magical. And in this game, it looked magical. Okay, what is yep. Nepo doing? A2 and resign? Just A2. A2 and resigns, but he only had a minute to figure it out. You said when it when it doesn't Why work, is it is playing? ugly, and that's how the first game looked. But this is just this is just over. Fixed. I say we go we go to the the other matchup where someone is 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 pretty much fighting for their life. And that is Sambel Tursahakian. He blundered his queen at the end of the last game if you missed it. So he is down one and a half half to Jospam, a guy that was a nightmare for everybody in the play-in yesterday. Um, Excuse me? Nepo resigned, by the way. Yeah, Nepo resigned. We move forward. Okay. And... Okay, this is probably... I'm trying to figure out who is the side... That's pushing here. I mean, obviously, objectively, it's a draw. In a bullet time scramble, I would probably take the side with a knight and the side with a pass pawn, which is black. But look at Jose's clock. He's got three minutes on his clock. This is going to be yeah. a draw. Yep, yeah. which is, you know, not the worst thing for Jose Martinez. But even if you're Sammy V, at least you get the white pieces with your last chance to tie things up. Sammy, Sammy V. <laughs> is that his new nickname? I mean, at this field, uh, look, uh, Samvel Tursahakian, and not that, not that we, you know, we can't pronounce names good on this show. The point is, Sammy V just rolls off the tongue 
a little more effectively. Plus that look he's got going, I feel like he could be an extra in a, in a, in a Goodfellas movie. Oh, totally. They're bringing Ghostbusters back. Why not bring back Goodfellas? You know, Sam Bell, that's a pretty badass name. And he's a great player, but he has his work cut out for him. Looks like they're repeating moves. I don't think there's any point in White trying to pretend that you're playing for a win here. Jose, okay, Bishop A5. I I'm sorry, for Black that you're playing for a win here. You have to go back to C6 and keep defending your pawn. And for Jose, he's actually the one trying. I think he's looking at Black's clock, and he's saying, listen, I have nothing to lose. He's trying to go King G3, Danny, and H4, yep. and expand on the King side. And it could get a little bit dicey for Black if Sam Bell is not careful. I completely oh, agree. This is this is the kind of thing that Jospin is known for doing. He wins a lot of games in time scrambles. A very mini Hikaru, as he kind of said on the show yesterday, that he's learned from a guy like Hikaru to persevere and to never give up. It paid off yesterday when he saved a dead loss, dead loss position against Nakamura. Okay, this is going to end in a draw. Very good move yes. at five here from Samvel, but. Uh, Speaking of draws, Vladislav Artemyev and Ali Reza Faruja drew their third game. So they are they are on a path toward Armageddon. Wow. Three draws there. Three draws in Giri versus Lazovic. And not for lack of trying. I mean, all of these games have been very combative. They've come down to essentially bear kings. But that's just how evenly matched the players are. And Vladislav Artemyev is one of the hardest players to beat. Period. I mean, that guy is the is kind of stereotypical Russian schoolboy player. I mean, beating yeah. Artemyev requires just an incredible concerted effort. I still think Farouz is the favorite in that match. But yeah. as I always say, anything can happen in one individual game. So if you're the underdog, you're really happy that it's coming down to a single fourth game. Completely agree. We talk about Artemia being so solid. We've talked to him. We've talked about Wesley So being like that too. A couple of guys whose style are it's just like built for fast time controls because they don't beat themselves. They don't blunder. And everybody blunders in rapid chess and in blitz chess. But guys like Artemia and So are just right. built different. They are built different. And By the way, looks speaking like of a Wesley drop. So being built. Yeah, we, we gotta go over to that game. Wesley So Oh my god. He, he's about to end this match right now. Wow. Somehow he was able to win, and he's about to checkmate Sam Sevian. Queenie won. It's mate in three. Queen G3 and knight D6 is mate. Wow. He wins the match. Two Wesley black wins. So. Getting it done. Claps his hands together. He gave oh, a little bit of a dance armed. there. Was that a little so... A so stutter step, the so swing. I don't know what that was, but you see that he kind of did a little little hop skippity when he got up. Listen, I'm really happy to score this victory. It was an incredible win. Two with the black pieces against <laughs> none other than Sam Sevian. Sam Sevian is known for his opening preparation, but he got disarmed and dismantled and yeah. dismembered in this match. He did. Disarmed, dismantled, dismembered. Of course, it's difficult when you're facing Wesley So. But the only matchup still going. Oh. We're going to check in. Okay, what, draw. What? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, there was a fork on F5. Brook ending draw. This one is going to give Sammy V one last chance with the white pieces. He has to win on command in the next game versus Jospin. Uh We peter out to a draw. But, you know, Danya... As I stretch my back, you know, we give shout outs to Secret Lab. We appreciate their sponsorship of the Champions Chess Tour. We love these chairs because they do have great oh, lower amazing. lumbar support. They're so helpful. But some people use Secret Lab chairs in different ways. We have Wesley So's permission to show the angle. Don't you stress. This is our fair play cam showing that Wesley. Oh, God. Wesley loves the angle that that Secret Lab chair provides. Apparently, that laptop needed some back support. I mean, this is, I'm, my posture is pretty decent, but I literally think this is making my back hurt, Danny. I, <laughs> this is I like... don't know in what world this is the setup. This is the ideal setup that causes Wesley to play his best chess, but clearly it is. And clearly he is playing his best chess right now. So I'm not complaining more of this, please. He does it all the time. I mean, we've seen him be crouched in on a massive monitor where the board was tiny for those who remember yeah. our fair play cam <laughs> shots from from a couple of years ago now he switched to using the secret lab chair in creative ways i mean i don't know that he's ever tried it because if you tried the pillow if you i mean you, these things listen, are made I to like sit it. in 
you know, Wesley, sit in the chair. Okay, Danya, results. We got some must-win chess for Sammy V, Sambel Tursahakian. Everybody else is is on path, I guess, to get yet another draw and take it to Armageddon, of course, besides Sam Sevian, who has already been sent home. I mean, we have a lot of potential upsets in the making. Ralph Mamedov climbs back with a win with the black pieces. He's got the white pieces. Ralph, very dangerous with white. Dennis Lazovic, I've been talking about him all day, and deservedly so. He's pulled off three draws against Anish Giri, and he also has the white pieces, and I think a great shot at scoring an upset. And Ferruja versus Artemia, total toss-up. Impossible to predict. These games have been extremely evenly matched. So that, that one might make a fourth draw going to an Armageddon. And I certainly wouldn't complain if we saw our first Armageddon of the day. My vote, my prediction, Danny, we're going to get at least one Armageddon, if not two. I, I would be shocked at this point if we do. We have three matches yeah. with Armageddon potential. There's Anish Giri, who's taken on the young Denis Lazovic. We just saw Vladislav Artemyev, the, the Chuck Norris of the Soviet, the modern Soviet chess school. I don't even know when and how he got that nickname. But uh, Ali Reza Ferruja, really nice display. Very well organized there on that, uh, that shelf behind him. Gucci Reza, ready to bring it better than nobody. Let's see what he can do with white. <laughs> Very good. Okay, d4, d5, and he has settled into a long think in this very new and unexplored position. Okay, choosing very interesting gambit, c4. Riveting, Danny. This is a fascinating opening. I think knight c3 is actually a novelty. <laughs> I'm not seeing any games in my database. <laughs> riveting. Riveting Queen's Gambit chess here. By the way, maybe we should send Wesley one of these other secret lab chairs I have. So if he has two, maybe he'll sit okay. in one while he uses the other one. That might be the secret. <laughs> right. so anyway, uh, uh, we'll talk about that with the team later. We see the confident swig of water. You're confident when you're on move three in a Queen's Gambit. That is for sure. Okay, Vladislav kind of burning some clock here, deciding what to play. Of course, knight f6 is the main move, but it's not the only move. And again, they get this Carlsbad pawn structure, which we saw in game one of Vincent Keimer versus Wesley. So in that game, we saw the move bishop f5, queen f3, yeah. and we saw this very fashionable ending. Of course, bishop f5 is not the only move. You can play bishop e7. Bishop d6 has been pretty popular recently. h6 and bishop e6 um, as well. And Vladislav plays it in the most traditional way. Bishop comes out to e7. This is how the old masters, Capablanca, Alakai, yeah. and even Steinitz, this is how they played uh, the Carlsbad, and there's nothing wrong with that. And this is how we might get the middle game I was talking about in that early Keimer versus So battle, the one we didn't get, where White's going to launch a minority attack, which is to advance the two versus three, hence why it's called the minority. White wants to get the move b5 in some positions. Or, okay, the knight ge2 development is revealing that the other plan is these f3 and e4 sort of slow play to change the structure in the center, of course, after you've castled and connected the rooks. And a5 is a move that designed to slow down that minority attack for White. So as, as uh, I was about to say Wesley, as Donya said, this is a very, very commonly traveled road. Both sides know what they're doing in this traditional QGD. Yeah, a5, grabbing space on the queen side, preventing white from, as you're saying, engineering the minority attack with b4. Now the move rook to e8. In many cases, you actually see black jumping into e4 uh, with his knight. So don't be surprised if you see the move knight to e4, even in response to queen to c2. If I remember correctly, knight e4 is a viable option, which is why white sometimes plays an early f3. And yep. f3 is a traditional plan for white. f3 to prepare e4. But Ali Reza decides to play it in a very kind of very tame, very plain vanilla fashion. We're going to get a long positional struggle here, most likely. Yeah, long positional struggle. Rook c1. Just uh, kind of asking Artemi of what line he wants to choose. Because you can go mm -hmm. for the 94 lines, but that's a very forcing and committal, committal move to make. So perhaps Artemiev is also going to continue to to sort of play chicken here and find another developing move before you commit. Yeah. In fact, knight d7, just sort of slow A4. jamming it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, very uh, kind of, you know, strategical battle. Uh, knight e4, maybe very interesting move, I think. 
Sorry. <laughs> Please I, uh, <laughs> wait for it. I, I wanted more. I wanted more. I was I was uh, waiting for how interesting that impression was going to was going to get. Um, in but, some uh, positions, right, we, you have to take the Uncle Sasha voice, right? That helps you play better you chess. Got, you got to do it. Um, Knight H5, the other the other other way to force the trade of the bishops, it guards G3. So white is less likely to exchange there. If the if the capture on e7 occurs, which it does, you're not allowing the second capture on e4, where white can maybe mm -hmm. force the structure towards something that he wants. So, okay, deadlock for a reason. Let's move to a game that has a little more dynamics going on. Mamedov with a teeny edge against Nepo in this one. Okay, yes. Yeah, so we have a bunch of minor piece trades already. We might get another one on b6. White essentially can take on b6 on demand. So this is kind of a weird Italian-y sort of structure with that semi-open f-file. Now, typically, I like being on the black side of these types of positions because you have long-term chances on the queen on the king side. Um, yeah. One maneuver that you might <clears throat> see is queen d7 to f7, and then the knight from f6 might jump in uh, to f4 via h5. But with so many minor pieces already off the board, I wouldn't be as scared as I normally am of getting caught uh, in an attack, if I'm Raf Mamedov, yeah, position is equal. I, I don't even really believe that engine evil point four. I would guesstimate that this is essentially a dead equal position. And if more pieces get traded here, we might actually see a peaceful result. But knowing Ralph Mamedov, he's probably going to go G4 or C4 or something four. And <laughs> we will see complications here for sure. G4, C4. I mean, heck, sometimes you can still go Bonk for D4, not right away. There's all kinds of fours available here. King H2 is a nice little flexible move. But we're going to stay flexible as far as the game we're committed to. We haven't checked on Dennis Whoa. Lozovic and Anish Giri. <laughs> Apparently Another these guys are game. just... Yeah, they're just dead set on Armageddon. Um, you know, depending on how how things shake out, we might have an opportunity to interview one of them. We'll see... Anish Giri or Dennis Lazovic, just neither side blinking, and we might be headed toward the ultimate tiebreaker, sudden death chess, Armageddon. Which, again, I think the, the longer this match goes on, uh, the higher the chance of something crazy happening. Dennis Lazovic would be happy with an Armageddon, but actually, I think Anish Giri might be a tiny bit better here. Just looking at this position from a basic standpoint, what are the pros and cons of both sides set up. Black has the pass pawn on c5, right? And black has a very nice rook on b5, which could potentially infiltrate the second rank. So I actually think that Anish should invest some time seeing if he can maybe put a little bit of pressure on Dennis, even just from a psychological standpoint, going into the Armageddon from a position of strength. But realistically, I think the likeliest outcome here by far is once again a draw, which will put us at four draws in a row between these two players. Dennis Lazovic, I continue to be impressed by this young man and the way that he's able to hold uh, Super GMs pretty effortlessly, it seems. You can easily confuse Lazovic, Dan Danny, for a Super GM himself, the way that he plays, the maturity and the kind of measured approach that he has. Knight F6, though, is a great move, and Anish Giri is going to try to push this position and play for the advantage. He is not just trying to bail out into a draw just yet. I like it. Okay, but maybe you've got Dennis Lazovic, this guy, this guy, as you said, he sent Hikaru home. Fans that are just getting here now are uh, are surprised by that. You thought you could show up late and still catch all the drama. Shame on you. No. Get here earlier. We've already had some incredible action, some shocking, shocking upsets, and uh, the Chessable Masters rolling on here, kicking off the 2024 Champions Chess Tour. Knight F6 is played. I want to go to a game that I think has – a uh, little bit more fire still left in the cannon. Queen to E3 okay. was just played by Sammy V, and he's also way down on the clock. D5, that's a committal move in this sort of hedgehog kind of structure. Jossman ready to strike. But it's an excellent move. And the point of D5, this is actually a typical idea in this line. That queen on E3 is incredibly misplaced. What do you want to do? You want to open up the E file in order to exploit yep. the awkwardness of the queen. So if white pushes C5 which is, I think, what Tersahakian was relying on. I think after e5, Danny, 
the position explodes and not in a good way for white. I mean, white just kind of collapses their C5, E5. Let's say white plays D takes E5. You know, how bad is this? Well, it's pretty darn bad. After rook takes C5, white also drops the C5 pawn. So yeah. that's out of the question. If you don't play D takes C5, well, not only does black threaten E takes D4, but black also has the positional threat of pushing the pawn down to E4. And mm -hmm. white is in huge trouble here right out of the opening. In a must-win game, let's not forget, not only does he need to turn this game around, he actually needs to win this game. It's looking really grim in the early going. Less than 20 moves in for Sam Bell. Sammy yep. E might be going down. And just to continue that line Donya pointed out, at this point, Black could trade everything, trade everything, and just win the pawn for free, which is free is as good as free. And it's funny, you really gave a... An educational point there. The d5, d5 is often a risky move in these structures if white can get c5 and keep a clamp on the natural central break. But d5 is really well timed, a heads up play by Jospom to say, actually, in this exact moment, it's the perfect time to strike. You also don't want to take, I mean, black can take back probably a number of ways, but, but they're all good in that situation. And if c5 isn't possible, then, then as well, you like to say, damn, girl. And this Bishop is already looking one. really good for Jasper. Yeah, I mean, this is an ideal position. If you only want to draw knight c5, black has complete control of the square in front of the isolated queen pawn. Jasper is forcing another trade of minor pieces. Uh, knight takes d5. He will play bishop takes d5. He will not play e takes d5, um, even though that seems to win a piece. But white has the knight jump to e5. Yeah. And so Jose is going to take back with the bishop. He's not just trying to win the game in one fell swoop. He's trying to stabilize and increase his clamp over the d5 square he's also up four and a half minutes this is going to take a miracle at this point a, a huge miracle for sam bell to turn this game around and win i don't see this happening yep. jose is in killer killer form for the second day in Dude, a row now again the birthday boy won the swiss yesterday Got a little bit of a gift from Hikaru Nakamura uh, in, in a game that... If Hikaru wins that game, you talk about sliding doors of the multiverse, Danya. Hikaru was literally not blundering his knight away from practically clinching his spot in Division One. right? That game goes the other direction when Nakamura blunders that piece, and instead, Jospom wins the Swiss, gets himself that first round bye, and continues on his fantastic form. Yeah, and of course, Sam Vell, relatively speaking, is a good pairing when you consider some of the other players in this round of action, but certainly not easy. And Sam Vell himself demonstrated some great form yesterday. Uh, he is going to keep trying to muddy the waters, but I think after Rook to C2, Black could try to double Rooks on the C file. Maybe White's only chance is associated with some sort of kingside attack. That's why I really like the move Rook to D4. He's trying to swing his Rook over to G4. And Danny, that Bishop on F1, it could ultimately activate uh, to D3. So there are some storm clouds that are gathering around Black's king. Jose has to tread carefully. He has to negotiate some landmines on the king side. But once he does that, I think he's got the situation under complete control nonetheless. Yeah, and he's got plenty of time to figure it out. More than a four-minute time advantage is usually pretty good when it comes to rapid chess. But okay. But okay, we have other games to look at. Ralph Mamedov and Jan Napomnishi head head themselves toward an end game. And yeah, uh, kind of deadlocked. Yeah, I think this is smart chess from Nepo, though, because if you're just tuning in, Nepo won the first game in this matchup, but Mamedov winning game three means that the momentum is favoring Ralph, so you kind of want to slow down. You definitely don't want to lose two in a row. It tends to happen from time to time, so... Nepo is uh, getting himself a safe one here. He'd be okay with Armageddon, perhaps, at this point. Yeah, I think my prediction of two Armageddons is aging pretty well. This game, I mean, the way it's going, another trade of minor pieces, A5, uh, which triggers further liquidation. A takes B5, A takes B4. The Rooks are going to get traded. White is temporarily going to be up a pawn, but White's going to have a bunch of weak pawns on the queen side. And I think, actually, if anything, Jan might be drawing this from a position of strength. I think if anybody has to be a little bit careful here, it might be Ralph Mamedov, who maybe should consider a move like Rook F to A2 in order to fight yeah. for control of the A file. He does play A takes B5. Okay. 
But I'm curious how he negotiates this subsequent phase of the game where Yana Pomnishi might try uh, to put some pressure on White's clock also. Yeah, these double B pawns. Unless he thinks... No. But the king is this a little bit unpleasant, yes. There's no way he's going to he's gonna try Rook to A2. corral that. Maybe. Rook A2, I mean, maybe. Rook F A2, but okay, yes. I was thinking if he trades, trades, and plays C4. I know that's crazy. Uh -huh. And then tries to corral the pawn with the rook and the knight coming around to C2. Okay, that's probably not what he has planned. But, you know. Oh, okay, not even... That's a fantastic move, actually. That's a fantastic yeah. move, Danny. Rook to c1 is a move that everybody should notice because why is he bringing the rook to a closed file? Because that file is about to open up. And one of Black's biggest weaknesses is that c7 pawn, which is contained by the pawn on b5. So Ralph Mamedov is concentrating his forces on quickly attacking the c7 pawn. He's actually fighting for the initiative here in this endgame. We've got some life some life left in this endgame. This is not just, you know, a dead draw. It's probably objectively drawn, but both sides have to demonstrate some precision here to keep the dynamic balance. What a game. And what an endgame this is promising to be. Agreed. That's a fantastic move. Okay. Take a swig of that water. I'm out of water. That's oh, wait, I got a little bit left. Actually... How about that Lazavik game? Could we check into that one? See if that's still basically within the realm of a draw? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. it. We can move on. <laughs> Samvel, Tursahakian, and... Oh! Ooh. Okay. Hold the phone. Okay, you called it. The storm clouds were gathering. Yeah. And now, okay. Bishop D3... Queen Bishop. comes into g5, sack, sack, mate, no big deal. I'm uh, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling Sammy V in the comeback. The problem, though, bishop d3 runs into bishop to h6. Actually, that is why ah. Jose brought his king to h7. He's not just hiding cowardly in cowardly fashion. The king itself is participating in the defensive effort. Bishop d3, bishop h6 was unpleasant. Apparently, that was still the way to go. Queen to g5 is a more human move. Yeah. But now bishop h6, queen f6, and maybe rook to c1. And white's backside but, is also really, really exposed. The problem I have with this line is, can't Jospin just repeat? If you play queen f6, bishop g7, uh, all I need is a draw, bro. Yeah. In and fact, I mean, Sam Bell realizes that he's got no chances. Yeah, but I mean, but that just gives it up. Like I, I'm like, That's this cool. game just ended. And there's the guy who continues to have an amazing chessable masters. We appreciate him blocking out the gazing sun from the window behind him. But I, I'm just shocked by how quickly that game came to an end, Yet That was just... By the way, to quickly show, we don't even need an analysis board because the game's over. But the move was bishop d3, bishop h6, and then rook to g5. Thanks, computer. Go bleep yourself, right? I mean, like, ah, uh, what? <laughs> like... Rook to g5 was White's best chance. The point is, if the rook moves, double pin. Rook takes h5, and you can't take because of the bishop, wow. can't take because the rook. Absolutely insane was the path that Sammy V had to find. So, okay. Jospom gets the dub. We can move on. Oh, sorry. He gets the dub in the match, draws that game. Okay. But what else is just we crazy? Have? Yeah. We have. Wait a second. Okay, we have what? this Ali Reza versus Artemiev game that we haven't checked yeah. out yet. 30 seconds, 30 seconds on the clock for Artemiev. He has been struggling with his clock for the entire match, but Artemiev is incredible with his last couple of seconds. It's really hard to get him to blunder. And if you look at this position, Danny, there's the prospect of some mass trades down the E-file. 20 seconds now on the clock for Artemiev. This is panic time if you're an Artemiev yeah. fan. Got to move, got to move, got to move. Panic time, got to move. I love Farouche's approach, even if it doesn't pay off and we head to Armageddon because he knows Artemiev is so solid. Look at the eval bar. Artemiev hasn't blundered this game. It's a deadlock game, but the clock is the problem. And I think if you have a match strategy against Artemiev, it's like, look, this dude is not going to lose on the chessboard unless he faces incredible odds and wow. awkward practical circumstances. Play fast. Get the dude under time pressure and see if he blunders. So 
just giving a shout out to Ali Reza. I think I think playing quickly was a concerted effort here. Wow, this is really high action. Now Ali Reza trying to find a way to complicate the game. And I don't know if he wants to do anything foolish. There is an increment here. So you don't just want to go for some gimmicky trap attempt. Knight to d7. Yeah. And is there rook takes d5? Rook takes d5. And rook in the event d5. of a capture, the rook on e7 is going to be trapped. Black is going to be up a pawn. Black is going to be down a pawn. So when I was going to say, white wins a pawn. <laughs> white wins a pawn at the end of the line if Ferrugia sees rook takes d5. Ferrugia doesn't miss exchange sacks very often. He loves himself wow. a good exchange sack, and we get the brilliant symbol. I'm like a kid in the candy store. Like, where's where, where's my brilliant? Oh, I can't do that. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to do this. Also, Jan Nepomnishi is putting Ralph Omedov under some serious pressure, apparently. Wow. <laughs> How do I get rid of him? How do I get rid of him? I can't. I can't click now away. Now you can get rid of him. Seven seconds. Okay, out clear all. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I feel like... I feel like using annotate on a zoom call where like, you know, it lets you annotate and then there's no way to get rid of the freaking ugly squiggly box. You wow. just drew to try to show somebody anyway. Good talk. Good talk. <laughs> okay. Time for Ferruja to figure out a move here. <laughs> His rook on D five is still kind of caught in limbo. And I wonder what, where he's going to put that rook rook D six. The black queen can drop back to C7 and continue harassing the rook. So this is actually a three-result game. It's not like Ali Reza is now completely out of the woods. He can totally blunder in this position. Agreed. There's also, I mean, I, I keep wanting to make rook takes D7 and D5 work. It Obviously, if rook takes D7, the bishop can capture, which means D5 is not a fork of the minor pieces. So uh, it doesn't quite work, but... It feels like the tactics here should be okay for white. The eval bar says they should, but with both sides under a minute, don't be surprised if we start seeing wow. some blunders here. Okay, this is going to be crazy. 50 seconds now for Ali Reza Ferruja. He is burning essentially the rest of his clock, trying to figure out where does he put his rook? What does he do with that rook on d5? If he plays rook f5, then he gives up the pawn on d4. This is going to be high octane action it's going to get crazy just about now. By the way, of the two matches that we didn't see the finish, Jan Napomnishi avoids Armageddon, delivering the knockout blow as black over Ralph Mamedov. But Anish Giri and Dennis Lazovic have officially drawn, so you and I will get some Armageddon chess. So don't go anywhere, boys and girls. We get free chess. It's Armageddon time, no matter what happens in this game. Bishop takes d5. Knight takes d5. Looks like Artemiev's running out of time. He's giving this up is... the rook on e7. I think Ali is going to win this one. Dude, you could even take b7, b7. first. Oh. He does. He takes b7. Everything's then he takes... falling. Everything's falling. Everything's falling. Yeah. This should be yeah. winning. This should be winning. Jeez. Jeez. Okay, now Ali Reza okay. has a technically winning position. Ali... Maybe he didn't make the most of this, though. Maybe he didn't make the most of this, and now Artemiev has got some chances to hold on to yeah. this position. He's up two pawns, but they're not the healthiest of pawns. The D pawn no. is isolated. The B pawn is backward. One second. You got to move. Okay. Got to move. move. Got to move. Got to move. move. Queen C5. Try to trade queens. Queen takes B2. Queen takes A5. Rook takes d4, doesn't work. Yep. Black gets checkmated. Yeah, queen okay, e5 well, he's now. Gonna he's going to offer the queen exchange and keep the a pawn. I think Ferruja is figuring it out. Yeah, I think white okay. is going to win. You know what the right switch is? Rook g4, flip the script and go for mate, and all of a sudden the queen and rook are out of play. Oh, he doesn't see it. Rook g4 was winning. Rook g4 still Rook g4 winning. is again. But he's just going to push his d pawn. He's just going to push okay. his d pawn, and this is just winning. I mean, unless he blunders his rook, this is yeah. over. He's got it. He's it's in the bag. H four. It was another a bold strategy, move. Cotton. It was yeah. a bold strategy from Perugia to just get the game in time pressure where Artemiev, the often perfect player, is finally able to able to blunder. Incredible. Wait a second. Speaking of blunders, there's a mate on G two. No, resigns. There's a mate on H four. Artemiev goes down to Ali Reza Perugia. 
which means every one of our matches is done and only one of them goes to Armageddon. That, of course, is Dennis Lazovic versus Anish Giri, two incredibly solid players. Big surprise. Nobody blinked here. Uh, obviously, all the Geary fans get mad when we mention four draws, but it's also a strength of his that he's so hard to beat. We'll see what Armageddon has, Danya. Wow, it's going to be a fascinating Armageddon. Dennis Lazovic doing everything that he's got to do to set himself up for success, but now he's got to deliver in this Armageddon match. I voted for two Armageddons. We're going to get one Armageddon, but I yeah. ain't complaining because what an Armageddon it's going to be between Denis Lazovic, the Belarusian phenom, and of course, Anish Giri. As you can see, the other matches ended in regulation. Jospam, Jose Martinez, builds on his form from yesterday. He won the play in Swiss on his birthday. He has officially punched his ticket to D1. Yana Pomna, she beats Ralph Mamedov. You just saw Faruja take down Artemiev. And Wesley So didn't even need a fourth game to get the job done versus Sam Sevian. But we will have Armageddon. You said, you said if you're Dennis Lazovic, this, this is part of the strategy. You beat Hikaru Nakamura. In some ways, you could say Hikaru Nakamura kind of beat himself there. Obviously, Hikaru didn't have his best form today. But in this one, you had a plan, which was to stay solid and take it all the way, take it to the distance against Geary. Yeah, and you have a plan. You're adhering to it. Now you need a smart bid. You need to keep your composure. And let's see if Dennis Lazovic's incredible run is going to continue, Danny. He needs a little break. He needs a breather. But this is going to be high-octane Armageddon action. And I'm glad that we'll be able to focus on one game. You know, <laughs> feels like a big relief, right? To focus on one game. And we get a break right now, which also we gives do. us some relief, or at least one of us. Because apparently, as I throw to a break, I've just been informed that I'm going to be hanging out for subscribers only in chat. I'm going to ask a question, and the first chatter to answer is going to get a one-month Diamond membership. So what's going to happen is I'm going to throw to a break. I'm going to run upstairs to the bathroom. I might even go Same. pee. I'm just being honest. Then I'm going <laughs> to come back. And I'm going to chat with subscribers. Don't go anywhere. The Chessable Masters and Armageddon on the other side of this break. Whether you're on a train, or on a plane, or you go completely off-grid, with Chessable's offline mode, you can now study chess anytime, anywhere, and not miss a day of training. And when you're back online, you just synchronize and everything is updated automatically. All right, first game we're going to play is rapid fire. All right. I'm going to name a sport, and you're going to tell me who the greatest player is. Basketball. Uh, Kobe. Kobe, all right. Baseball. Uh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, the ones who play at the St. Louis Cardinals, they have some young players. Uh, I think Pools? Mike, was Mike Matini up there. Mike yeah, Matini? Yeah, yeah. I like him. Yeah. Okay. I meet him all what about What about soccer? Uh, Lionel Messi because he's very consistent. Okay. Also, since uh, back in college days he was already n number one, and he's still okay. He's still until recently number one. Football. Mahomes. I watch him. I watch also his commercials. Okay. Tennis. Djokovic. Djokovic. All yes. right. I love it. Golf. I guess everyone says Tiger Woods, but there's this uh, very pretty girl, a Paige Spearna. All right. I like it. All right. What about yeah. uh, poker? Gosh. I only know. Jennifer Shahad. <laughs> <laughs> she, she yeah. Yeah, yeah, I only know her and Chris right. Chuk. So. You hear that, Jen Shahadi? You're the goat. You're yeah. the goat of poker. All right. <laughs> Chess. Chess. Uh, Danny Wrench. Okay, come yeah. on. You're the best. I appreciate it. I'm yeah, going to say Wesley you, so then. You said favorite, right? The favorite. Or who's the yeah. goat? Who's the goat? Goat? Yeah. Hard to choose. Uh, I'd say Fisher for now. But okay. I, I, suppose, I suppose the right answer is Krausen, but I'll say Fisher because he's okay. American. Okay. Just boxing? I'll pick my boy Kanti. Oh, I love it. Yeah, he, yeah. Has, he hasn't done it yet, but he, he I think he might be one of the greatest ever when he's done. Probably, yeah, he's uh, pretty, yeah. pretty good. Your favorite movie? 
Well, say Lord of the Rings first comes to mind. Okay. Classic. I can watch it uh, over and over again. But oh. there, I know. Uh, I like the the very the newest bat the Batman. Okay. Three hours long. The I latest like, one. So I like it. Yeah, it's one, I think it it's the best good. Batman movie ever. Okay. Favorite TV show? Is The Crown a TV show? The Crown? Yeah. It yeah. Is. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna go watch it right after this tournament. The 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 latest season. I love. That's it. great. That's great. Favorite author? I'd say Sam Shanklin if he writes more books. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Like, I, I really want to read Levy Rosman's book, so okay. I'll get there one day. Well, on Levy, I'll ask you, who's your favorite chess creator? Uh, well, Hikaru. I, I, I love uh, his uh, Twitch streams, although since his Switch websites, I've been following him less. Yeah. But when he was in Twitch, like, I enjoyed watching his uh, title Tuesday stream, especially. Like, yeah. Blitz or classical? Classical. Online or OTV? Over the board. E4 or D4? E4. Fisher or Kasparov? Uh, yeah, that's a hard question, but I go with Fisher at the moment. Closed or open positions? Open. Open positions. Searching for Bobby Fisher the movie or The Queen's Gambit on Netflix? Mm, yeah, it's a tough question, but I go with The Queen's Gambit. Okay. Okay, Catalan. It's the most exciting happening in all of professional sports. Sudden death, Armageddon, dodgeball. I mean chess. Donya Naroditsky alongside Danny Wrench. Anish Giri versus Dennis Lazovic. Danya, woo, are you excited? I am thrilled. It's going to be such an exciting Armageddon. Dennis Lazovic has a chance to extend uh, the tournament of his life. I mean, defeating Hikaru Nakamura and now oh so close to taking down Anish Giri, but he needs a money performance in the Armageddon in order to make that happen. Both players have submitted their bids. I think we know officially who's playing which color, but I won't spoil it. While we get that 100% confirmed, let's remind the fans watching, perhaps for the first time when it comes to Armageddon, how the stuff works. Welcome to the most exciting format in chess, Armageddon. The ultimate tiebreaker. Armageddon grants White more time on the clock, but in return, White must win. A draw secures black the match win. White starts with 10 minutes and each player submits a confidential bid with an amount of time they are willing to start with. Lowest bid gets to choose their color, usually black, and those coveted draw odds. Let the Armageddon commence. Let the Armageddon 
commence. Let the Armageddon commence. Players bid for time. As we said in the explainer, the winner gets to choose their color and the time. Opponent starts with 10 minutes. That's the base time. The biggest difference is there's no increment, which means we will have a decisive result because either someone flags, someone wins, or if it's a draw, Black takes the victory. Danya, it's the greatest thing of all time. It's Armageddon Chess. It's Armageddon Chess. We all love it. It promises a decisive result. That is the genius of Armageddon. We know that we will get a winner at the end of the game, Danny. And who that will be remains to be seen. Most players, they usually like to be black in the Armageddon format because they like the extra benefit of draw odds. But obviously, extra time is also extremely important. And when you're dealing with someone as well-prepared as Anish Giri, I mean, <clears throat> you don't necessarily want to face Anish Giri with the black pieces. Although Dennis has done a great job of it so far with both colors. Yeah, it, it, well, we, we have the bid right here. You said Dennis has done a great job, and he did a great job in the bid. If what he wanted was drawing chances, he outbid Anish Giri by eight mm -hmm. seconds. Fascinating to see with the 10-minute base time control how aggressive the players are willing to get. They all tend to have the same meta. Whoever's coaching these guys on the meta strategy of Armageddon bids, if there's like some secret, you know, Dibaretsky secret world-renowned trainer on Armageddon bidding, I always find it fascinating how close the bids are. In fact, when we were in Toronto, Danya, the amount of times we had the same exact bid by both players was fascinating. But there you have it. Dennis Lazovic, the ultra-solid Dennis Lazovic, will get draw odds in this battle. No, pretty incredible. Dennis Lazovic, 6 minutes and 50 seconds. And uh, he needs to play fast in the opening because we have to remember there is no increment in Armageddon. This is the big difference, and this is what makes it hard to adjust for the players to Armageddon. You're playing with increment. You're used to being able to drop all the way down to a couple of seconds. Can't do that now. Flagging is yeah. very much on the table, Danny. Flagging is on the table. In fact, it's encouraged, right? We uh, we like things to get brutal here in the Armageddon format, the Armageddon final game and tiebreaker. Dennis Lazovic, I think, I think he made the right call with Black. And it's not just because I think he's taking Anish Giri out of his comfort zone. I think Anish Giri would much rather be in a position to be solid and be Black. But because mm -hmm. he himself, Dennis Lazovic, just doesn't beat himself. He doesn't lose games because of blunders. So I think this was the right practical call. But we'll see. Maybe it's a wake-up call for Anish Giri that he's going to have to play aggressive chess and do the thing he's not normally known for, which is uh, which is going all out. Yeah, um, we'll see. Anish Giri has played in relatively plain vanilla fashion thus far with the white pieces. And like you said, maybe a change of openings, maybe one E4 uh, instead of one knight F3 or one D4 like Anish has been playing so far. Maybe that's what you need yep. from the CEO of chess.com. He wears right. many hats, but right now he'll need to wear the hat of the winner of an Armageddon game. Never an easy feat to achieve. Talk about an April Fool's joke we did that – that I don't know if we wish we could take it back, but if you Google chess.com CEO, I'm pretty sure Anish Giri comes up before anyone else, which is fascinating. For years, people thought I was chess.com CEO. It is not. It is it is Eric. <laughs> uh, Co-founder Eric is actually the CEO. I've got the made-up title. It's what they give high school dropouts who don't belong here, uh -huh. chief chess officer. But Damn, um, bro. Anish Giri is the, is the official CEO by most people's standards if you Google it. And uh, there you go. I, here we go. We are off. We're off to see the wizard. Okay. It's night of three. It is night of three. And once again, it's a Kali system, which did give Anish Giri the kind of position that he wanted uh, in their second match game. It was a slight edge for white. Nothing ultimately came of it. But in an Armageddon game, black has less problems, less time to solve problems that white will pose him out of the opening. This is similar to what Anish had against Max Warmerdam in their final game of Tata Steel. Yeah. And we might be headed straight for an IQP battle if the tension breaks and Black has an isolated queen pawn. It's dynamic enough that you're you're definitely going to get winning chances. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's good. But IQPs have the potential to get real simple real quick. If we get this structure and Black finds a way to orchestrate D4, you can see a lot of minor pieces traded. So Anish is going to be careful here, maybe use his time advantage to keep as many pieces on the board as he can. Okay, 94, big move by Dennis Lazovic. Now, in the event of a trade on E4, that's out of the question for White because the D4 pawn 
is a potential liability. White, I think, just has to keep the tension in Castle. And Dennis mm -hmm. Lazovic brings the bishop out to f6. I like the opening setup here as he pressures the pawn on d4. Agreed, Town. Population us. Both <laughs> players playing perfect chess so far. 100% accuracy for those who like to follow along with... Uh, with interesting stats at chess.com slash events. Rook to C1 played now. It's a good move. And after you take E4, we're getting a big old simplification. A huge this is... trade. A uh, massive trade. I don't Anish, know. Anish is okay with it, apparently. But if you take with the queen, you're in an endgame. Even if you have a small advantage. I, 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 I don't know <laughs> about this bishop e6 and rook fd8, and I'm not even sure that white is better here. I mean, the engine is giving a minuscule advantage for white, but see, the problem is that Lazovic has only spent 30 seconds. He's gotten almost all the pieces off the board, and now he plays the right developing move, bishop e6. Rook to c7 is very tempting, but it can be safely met with rook to d7, and with every piece that disappears from the board, Dennis Lazovic's defensive task becomes easier and easier so I don't know. Anish is better. He's got some chances here, but he needs to demonstrate Magnus Carlsen level endgame precision if he wants to carry this one home. I, you said it. You said it best. I don't have much else to say. I'm sitting here racking my brain with how this goes differently. I think that, you know, some players have openings in their tool bag that they know they have to use for win on command scenarios. Mm -hmm. I, I you know, if this doesn't work out and Anish is going back to the drawing board, you have to be a little critical about maybe not looking for something with with more dynamics, you know, something a little bit trickier. This, this is a pretty simple, and, and it's also an easy position for Black to play, right? Because you look at the clock, he's, he's only used a minute. He's only used a minute, and the big question here is going to be whether White's pass deep on is ultimately going to make its presence felt. Can you... Yep. ultimately disarm the blockade the black has instituted on the bishop on d5 also the rook on c7 is a really unpleasant piece black is containing black is containing the rook but it's still a really unpleasant position so dennis lazovic has to watch his clock i would trade on c7 and play a move like g6 make some luft mm -hmm. so that you don't have to worry about the constant problem of back rank mate g6 and i think black is more or less okay yeah, and not even a lot to analyze here. I think g6 is a great move. It opens up not just the Luft, but prepares for the king to get involved and help. And what's the forcing way? What is the way that white creates something? You're, you're probably bringing the king to e3. But okay, not a lot going on here. Not a lot going on. And Dennis Lazovic chooses this moment to pause. I think he's thinking about E takes F3, but he finds, he finds the move G6. Anish yep. Giri is probably going to bring his king up to F2. Anisha's goal here is to keep the tension as long as possible. Milk Black's clock down because at some point flagging, as I said, Anish Giri is not, you know, a noted flagger, but if he's got three minutes and his opponent has 10 seconds and you've got two rooks on the board, yeah, obviously he's going to go for the win. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm I'm thinking about the other other strategy here, and you know I remember an armor getting battled that Anish Giri lost in an otherwise tame looking rook endgame. Of course, you know what I'm talking about, Nihal Sarin against Anish Giri from the Chess.com Global Championship. You and I were in Toronto, so there is something to the idea that there's no increment. Let's get a rook ending where yeah, normally you would draw. But maybe I just put you in a position where I just straight up flag you. Absolutely. And now it's Anish Giri's turn to take a longer thing. King F2 is what I was expecting. Maybe he's considering F takes C4, Bishop takes C4, and then Bishop to C4 going after the F7 pawn. But that feels like it liquidates the game even further. And Black really starts to knock on the door of a draw after Rook takes D4 yep. in that position. Yeah, it's F takes, Bishop takes, Bishop to C4. A couple options there. You could take D4 for F7. You could play Bishop D5. And at the end of the trade, though, white wins two for one. So you probably don't yep. want that rook ending. I think, although, do you? Because if you take B7, yeah, yeah. White, white gets both in time. So, so okay. I guess this is worth, worth considering. Anish is uh, ultimately declining doing it. Plays king of two. 
Okay, on the board. Good move. Still very much... Still very much a game. Still very much a game, and Black still very much in the defensive here. He takes f3. But after g takes f3, Danny, the bishop can drop back to c6, and I'm not actually sure that Anish Giri will be able to defend the d4 pawn. This is looking really grim right now for Anish. He needs a big mistake from Denis Lasvik. He needs some sort of a nervous move in order to garner real chances here. Yeah, let's let's analyze that because I think it's it's trickier than it first looks. The best move here, according to the engine, is bishop takes f3. But the reason is if g takes, as Donya said, bishop c6, you can play king e3, yep. but here comes a draw. And the reason is that after check, you can't go to d3 because bishop b5 and it's game over. Exactly. And exactly. if you go to d2, we just head right back to d8 and you're in a similar spot. So, and although maybe he can go to c3 at the end of the line. Yes, I think this might be the best chance. And he's made a move. Yeah. And it is. Let's see what he's captured with. Ooh. He has captured with. Look, he took with the pawn, but Lazovic didn't go for okay. bishop to c6. Instead, Which king is fine. Nothing wrong with King F8. I mean, he's maintaining the status quo. And right now, he's basically asking Anish, like, where is the win going to come from? And now I would give a check on E8 and go back to D8. Or go back to E7, potentially. Go up to E7. Yeah, and also asking Anish, where's the advantage, right? Because guess what? There is none. The, the time advantage on the clock is all but gone. It's all but gone. I, I don't see this working out for Anish. Rook back to E8. The bishop endgame is a dead draw. Black has zero problems there. Anish needs to play rook c5. He needs to just try to outplay his opponent. And in, at this point, an equal endgame. Yeah. Played it. Okay. Going to try to keep the pieces on the board. Keeping hope alive. Not really. Most likely a draw, Dennis Lazovic. Look at the clock situation also, Danny. It's now fully equalized. Yeah. Mr. Lazovic sent Hikaru Nakamura to Division 2 and uh, might be about to do the same to Anish Giri. The youngster. Incredible. I wanted to say the youngster from down under, but he's not from Australia. The Belarusian <laughs> youngster. Okay, A6 now. Simply defend the pawn. And the key for Dennis is not to panic here. The key is not to start feeling nervous, not to start, you know, spinning the narrative in your mind. Oh, this is how close I am. Just play chess. Just play it as as you would any other endgame. And he is a fantastic endgame player. I think he's got this completely under control. He's now up on time. King e6, king d6. I think Anish needs to try bishop c4 at some point, but it, it's all kind of a one-move threat. I, this is amazing. Agreed. Agreed, agreed. Oh, but okay. But okay. Uh, but okay, what? I, like, where's the, where's the but threat? But okay, <laughs> yes. Okay, right. you could also could have played rook d7, but this is simple enough. And who's going to be playing for a win here in a minute? Yeah. Probably black, given that he's up on the clock. Mm, I, I don't like rook c2, though. I th okay, rook c2 is a very concrete move. Maybe I do like it. No, no, rook c2, I, and I, simply he's going after the a pawn. Okay. I don't. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm turning around the thought that all black needs is a draw here, and wow. again, I think that a lot of this comes back to the the great bid from Dennis Lazovic to put Geary in a position to win his white. Not something Anish Geary probably likes to do. And amazing, an, just amazing. Clinical. Dennis it, felt like Anish, clinical. it felt like Anish had, had no chances from the start of this game. Now look at the clock. Yep. He's down 40 seconds. So Dennis Lazovic has the luxury of taking his time, and he's probably going to take the pawn on a2. My guess is that we're going to see bishop c4 by Anish trying to get it into something yep. like an unbalanced rook endgame. But even the move rook to a5 here, just keeping the bishop on d5, I think is good enough to hold the draw. Amazing. Amazing. And the eval bar is only equal if White chooses the forcing draw lines. But reminder, right. we're in Armageddon here. A draw and Dennis Lazovic wins anyway. So don't be surprised when that eval bar quickly shows that Black is winning when Anish Giri refuses to let the game end peacefully. So just fantastic chess. A fantastic day from Dennis Lazovic right now. And I would say the last hurdle 
right now is this Rook end game because White is down a pawn, but White does have a rather menacing set of pawns on the queen side. D5 check, king to e7, and Rook b8 can be tried by Anish, and he is threatening the move c6 here. So okay. Dennis needs to be a little bit careful. King d7 maybe just stop the Rook from infiltrating to the 7th rank. Yes, on the board. King e7. Just go back. But okay. But Black also could have just checked because if White ever goes to e5, it's checkmate oh, in the end with f6. In. Wow. Great spot. So, I mean, Black could just check, check, check. And again, if you're checked on d4 and try to hide, that's f6 checkmate. Wow. So, okay. Lazovic doesn't go for it. Is c6 check a move? No. King c7. Well, d6 is a move. Maybe you could try d6 and... I feel like it's gotten a little bit scarier for Denis Lazovic. Anish Giri knows that objectively he doesn't have much, but he has to find a way to tighten the screws, make it as practically difficult as possible for Denis. Although d6, rook b5, and then king d4. So I, my vote is d6 here. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta I try agree. it. Gotta, Gotta try, try it. it. You're saying there's a chance. He's done it. Good move. He does it. Okay. Now maybe a5. Dennis can basically do nothing here, but that's always kind of hard to make yourself do when you're on the verge of panicking. So still some work to do for black. Rook b5 allows king to d4. So you can't win the pawn directly. Yeah. And you definitely don't want the king to get to d5. That would be a problem. You could try to push a5 and go for a race. Geary hoping for absolute fury, working our last subscriber's name into the commentary. Here, we're hoping for some absolute fury on the chessboard to keep the uh, the fire alive. Okay. Shout out to the 60-month subscriber. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, this is getting complicated for Dennis. Rook to c4 is an excellent move, though. Going after the c5 pawn and temporarily sacrificing actually a bunch of his pawns. But as long as yeah. he can eliminate the c5 pawn, I think he should have enough to draw the game. Yeah, if c5 falls, d6 will come with it. And what's funny is, even if somehow white wins both of these pawns, in theory, this is also a drawn ending as long as the king is within striking distance. You can't win with the split corner and bishop pawns. Yeah. Okay, that's not necessarily what Lazovic is shooting for, especially with no increment, but it is something to keep in mind. It is indeed. And now 90 seconds for Anish Giri as he desperately tries to find a way to keep the game going. Rook takes b7, rook takes c5, rook takes h7. Lazovic will just slide his rook over to d5. And now flagging is more or less off the table. Anish Giri investing the rest of his time to figure something, any way to keep the game going. Rook d5. I mean Flagging is off the H5. table for a niche, not necessarily off the table for Dennis at this point. I mean, <laughs> That's right. He... Uh... I mean, okay, you can take h4. You can also play rook d5. I think Anish even knows that this one is uh, That's is it. out of reach to expect a dub. I mean, Dennis more than happy to give up the g6 pawn for the d6 pawn and get a Philidor position. The last hurdle for Dennis, I would play g5 here and swing my rook back to h6. Just go get rid of that d pawn. Yeah. You could also go rook a4 and rook a6. I mean, I find yeah. it very difficult to imagine a way that Black could lose this. The only thing he should do is be careful on the clock. Make a move. Also good. Also great. Yeah. Simple enough. Yep. Rook retreats. Rook the rook five, inches rook its six. way over to d6. And, and Dennis uh, is not even going to give up his pawn. Danny. No. Dennis is not even going to give up the G6 pawn, so that's it. This is over. He doesn't need to. Honey Badger takes what he wants. He's going to take D6 without giving up G6. And, I mean, he's 30 seconds up. Only Dennis can flag his opponent. Barring a Rook blunder, this is a draw. Always a little nerve-wracking. <laughs> Always a little nerve-wracking. Look at Anish. He's doing his best. Ha <laughs> 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 I love your I love your pure excitement. But speaking of excited, Dennis Lazovic, the kid, sends home Hikaru Nakamura, not home, sends him to D2. Anish Giri will join his uh his fellow 2800 club member. Are we looking at a future member of the 2800 club? Dennis Lazovic gets the job done, draws with black. 
pretty sure he's nodding to our Fair Play team. Shout out to the event staff making it happen behind the scenes, saying, hey, Dennis, you up for an interview? He's like, sure, I'll do it. I'll do it. Oh, yeah. Dennis Lazovic. And he does Incredible, it. Danny. He adhered to the exact strategy that we outlined. He took Anish Giri into a deep, dark forest. He dragged yep. out the match, and then he delivers Armageddon with Black. The ease with which he held Anish, amazing. Well, he's got a style that we always say is is perfect for these types of fast time control events. He gets openings that he plays more often than his opponents. He knows the tactics almost. You could argue his strength is even better because he's getting those positions so often. Just doesn't beat himself. Dennis Lazovic showing why he is a name that everybody needs to get used to. But all right, get used to where you're sitting because we're not done yet. We're going to grab an interview, I think, with Dennis Lazovic, maybe one of the other players. But either way, we'll be back in just a few moments with the final moments of the Chessable Masters. In the meantime, apparently, we're actually, we might stay right here. Apparently, we're not going to go to a break. Okay. No break. And we're all... And we're, we're no break. I don't know. But we're, at some point, going to either go to a break or be joined by an interview. I'm waiting to be told. <laughs> okay. On the meantime, very exciting Armageddon that we had just now. Congrats <laughs> to Dennis Lazovic. What's the word? What's the verdict? Now we can go to a break. And uh, while we're at the break, enjoy... A little behind the scenes footage, the man behind the internet chess boom in many ways, Gotham Chess. He's the internet chess's teacher, according to most, and also chess.com's creator of the year. Enjoy this content. Get to know Levy a little better. We'll be back with an interview, the final moments of the Chessable Masters when we return. goal is get you to a comfortable spot in those first 10 opening moves and just have you hitting that gas. That's all folks. Thanks so much for checking out my E4 course here on Chessable. I do hope you enjoy. I got introduced to chess because uh, my family is you know, obviously both my mom and dad's side is from uh, former Soviet Union uh, and it's kind of part of the culture there so I was playing with my grandfather when I was about five and I, I, I think what attracted me when I was younger is I just got the game. I got the game probably on the level how most modern day grandmasters got the game. I could see something once and I could just go demolish adults, kids. Uh, and, and for most talented players, that's how it is for a long time. They just obsess over the game. I hate to compare it to art, but in many ways it is. I find it fascinating. Every day I can teach myself something. I played it for 20 years and there's still so much I don't know. I can play Blitz games and I can make Masterpiece or Chaos with White, with Black. What a time to be alive, you know, because I still have insecure chess teacher syndrome from 2019 when I was just going to private lessons and nobody knew who I was and I still remember those days. And, I, like, I very easily just think about them, and I, I'm not, I'm completely the same guy. I just happen to do it on camera now. Last World Championship, I was looking at five streams at the same time, like, getting all the information, trying to understand the position more, uh, like, I, uh, keeping in mind what I'm going to say in the recap a couple hours later, who, who said what. That's the stuff that, that I really I get excited by, just knowing that it was, it was a good recording, it was funny, it was, I presented everything I want to present. Uh, that stuff, I guess, is like a cycle that, that gets me more energy. I really enjoy making a high quality piece of content. It, it is very natural for me uh, to do the presenting. Like, I'm not fake at all. I think that's one of the reasons I can, I can stream and stay sane. But like sometimes even I'm exhausted and after I record a video, I have more energy, which doesn't make sense. I feel good about the current career. I. I don't spend a huge amount of time being uh, introspective about 
the current career. I, I'm just working as hard as possible. With me, it's just me and the camera, which, which is even, I don't know, I wouldn't even argue it's more weird that it's just me in a room. From 2020 until now, I'm still just some dude who likes to talk about chess, and I just so happen to do it in a uh, in an exciting way for a lot of people. And obviously, okay, my confidence has grown in presenting and knowing that what I put out will get watched, which is, you don't have that guarantee when you start. It's very nice, and it's not something I, I take uh, lightly, but at the end of the day, if you really break it down, I'm just a dude who talks about chess. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video. I've taken an approach in this course where I will happily enter the main lines of certain openings for the first five or ten moves before deviating into something that's aggressive, interesting, uh, and will definitely make people
The play-in stage comes to an end after two days of thrilling action. We had a Swiss. We had some incredible matches today. He was alongside me the whole time, John Yanaroditsky, Danny Wrench here. But now we have another man joining us alongside a youngster, a youngster who is making a name for himself by sending some of the biggest names in the game to Division II, respectively. Dennis Lazovic. Dennis, uh, welcome in. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. And let me let me just ask you straight up. Uh, you and I did an interview in Toronto. You talked about your, your cat, Bushka. Can't wait to meet Bushka. Is that where Bushka sits on the window right there? Is that a cat pillow to, to behind you on the left? Is that for Bushka? Yes, <laughs> for Bushka. <laughs> Is Bushka around? Can I meet Bushka? No, Bushka in some other, other room. Okay, that makes me sad. But all right, at some point I'm going to meet Bushka. You got to remember that. Instead, I'll just I'll keep mittens by me. But all right, John, you take it away. Well, Dennis, congratulations! Uh, two huge wins. Um, let's talk about your match against Hikaru. Uh, what does it mean for you to defeat Hikaru? Is that a special feeling? And can you share your thoughts about the match overall? Yes, of course. I I won. Only one games again. Only one game against Hikaru in Title Tuesday. So of course to to win two games, it's it's uh, it's very nice. I mean, in of course the most important game was first. He, I mean, probably he mixed up something in the opening, but after H4 Queen F6, I I didn't see. Uh, a good move for him, and after that, I I think I I played quite good and just I was just up up a rook, and so I I managed to to convert this position. It was it was amazing. You you converted the position with ease, and then <laughs> you moved on to facing Anish Giri, a super solid player, but. You also seem to handle that match with ease. Was it part of your strategy to be willing for a bunch of draws if that was how the match progressed? Were you already thinking that, hey, I'll take my chances against Anish Giri in the Armageddon tiebreaker if that's if that's the case? Yeah, I think when, uh, when you play against opening, uh, which is... Uh, you know, play better than you. It's uh, it's it's quite logical to try to make some draws and go to the Armageddon because it's uh, improve your chances. Of course, I I wanted to win some games, but you know, I I didn't manage to do that. And in um, in the last game, I was. A bit worse, but yeah, I, I managed to make a draw in, in Armageddon. I I think I didn't have many big problems, so yeah. Uh, Dennis, you are playing Maxima Shilagrov tomorrow. Another incredibly difficult matchup for you. Have uh, you had experience playing Maxime before? And what are your thoughts on the match uh, tomorrow? Yeah, I I only played against him in Toronto, so I I have some good experience because I I won uh, I won that match and yeah I I think I will some I will have some chances so I today I played quite uh, quite well I think and I will try to. To do it uh, tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. You did. You did play quite well today, Dennis. We we wish you the best of luck doing it tomorrow. You don't seem to get super nervous facing these super GMs one after another. And if you keep your wits about you, you know who's to say you don't send another one home. So congratulations, Dennis. Go uh, go snuggle with with Bushka. Give Bushka <laughs> my best. Thank you. Bye, Dennis. Congratulations. Right. As Dennis goes to uh, to see the cat, 
the, the legendary Bushka. We probably need to get Bushka a bot on chess.com. We've given <laughs> we've given Paunch the Absolutely. Punch the Meister, Levon Aronian's dog, a bot. Why not Bushka? But all right, it's Vashe the Grav, Lazovic, Nepomnishi, Martinez, Carlson. So OMG. Oh, I just saw that. Woo! I just got a little hot over here. Wesley, so Magnus Carlson, and then Fedose of Perugia. I mean, I'll ask you to circle a matchup, but uh, who says that Carlson doesn't get sent to the loser's bracket tomorrow, huh? No, but this is going to be an, another incredible day of action. I'm looking forward to Nepo versus Jospam. Nepo pulling out that match against Mamedov out of the clutches of defeat. And Carlson, so that's just become a classic at this point, Danny. Yeah. Not even that I'm rooting for Wesley, but I think when you look at a guy who's probably going to be a little more fresh, you, you look at Carlson. But if you're looking for a guy who's already got the kinks worked out, we know that Magnus historically starts slow, Danya. That's a nightmare matchup. Like, to it me, I, again, I don't know if the players are still choosing their opponents. And if Magnus chose Wesley, I don't think so, because MBL actually won the the last event, the AI Cup of last year so he was the top seed so we'll, we'll get a little more info on that of course when i say we i mean the royal we it'll be david howell tanya sachdev and robert hess you and i will be watching as fans starting tomorrow danya but i it's awesome magnus carlson versus wesley so i guess i know what i'm doing on a friday i guess i know what i'm doing too on a friday but danny i just wanted to say it's it was a great honor uh, to cover the first two days of the cct season with you this was so much fun and I'm really, really happy that things kicked off in such a combative, um, such an action-packed manner. Really, really sets the tone for the entire season, honestly. Not just for this tournament, but for the entire series. And yep. I will be watching on the edge of my seat tomorrow. But I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed the last two days of the commentary. I love Tata Steel, but with full due respect, this was action of a different kind. I love it. Well, and before I let you go, let me remind everybody, it is action of a different kind, but the action will continue. Let's give everybody a look at the full schedule. You and I just wrapped up the divisional placement rounds. Starting tomorrow, it's division play until we get to our grand finals. Remember, we have a break now in the schedules. There's a rest day built in for whoever punches their ticket all the way to the grand finals in division one. They get to enjoy some D2, D3 action. And with some of the biggest names in D2 and D3, whether it's Hikaru Nakamura, Fabio Nakarwana, so many others, the stakes there are very high because if you win those divisions, you really set yourself up for the next tour event to have an easier route. So, so much chess ahead. After that D2, D3 broadcast day on the 6th, we move back to our grand finals. Somebody will be making their way from the double elimination losers bracket for a chance to win it all. Can't wait to see who it is. I'm going to make a prediction. I think whoever loses the match between Magnus Carlsen and Wesley So probably is still fighting on February 7th for their chance back in the grand final. It's going to be it's going to be amazing, Danya. But all right. I'll throw the compliments back at you. It was amazing to work with you. You and I did it. Vid it. We Thank did you. it. We kicked things off here. The 2024 Champions Chess Tour is underway. Shout out to the whole crew, our production team, the mods, the family, keeping it real. I'm going to hang out and chat a little bit as we take a break. For my partner, Tanya Naroditsky, this was the Chessable Masters. Enjoy Tanya and the boys starting tomorrow. <laughs>